Hello and welcome to Vox Olympia book readings. Our reading recordings are made possible by the generous endowment of the B.L. Hemavati Literary Arts Foundation. Our reading recordings are made for the benefit of the blind, the reading disabled, children of the world, and whoever else who may be interested in our selection of books. Vox Olympia book readings are made available on our podcasts, Vox Olympia audiobooks, on Anchor.fm, Spotify, Google, and Apple Podcast apps. On this day, the 21st of August, 2022, we begin with a reading from the book The Outline of History by H. G. Wells. Thanks, listeners, for tuning in. The Outline of History Being a Plain History of Life and Mankind by H. G. Wells Volume 1 Doubleday and Company Incorporated, Garden City, New York. Copyright Information Copyright 1920, 1931, 1940 by H. G. Wells. Copyright 1949, 1956, 1961 by Doubleday and Company Incorporated. Copyright 1971 by Doubleday and Company Incorporated and G. P. Wells. This book is obtained As a copy from Internet Archives, the original book manufactured in the United States of America. Outline of History by H. G. Wells Scheme of Contents Volume 1 Introduction The Story and aim of the outline of history how it came to be written the method of writing the outline of certain omissions and additions the revision of 1949 of subsequent editions Book 1 
the world before man. Chapter 1 The Earth in Space and Time The great expansion of men's ideas of space and time, the earth in space, how long has the earth endured, are there other worlds among the stars? Chapter 2 the record of the rocks. The first living things. The drifting continents. Natural selection and the changes of species. Chapter 3 Life and Climate Life and Water, Water Plants The Earliest Land Animals Why Life Must Change Continually Chapter 4 The Age of Reptiles The Age of Lowland Life Dragons The First Birds An Age of Hardship and Death The First Appearance of Fur and feathers. Chapter 5 The Age of Mammals A New Age of Life Tradition comes into the world, an age of brain growth, the world grows hard again. Book 2 The Making of Man Chapter 6 Apes and Submen The Origin of Man The First Implements Fossil Submen Chapter 7 The Neanderthal men, an extinct race, the Middle Paleolithic Age, the genus Homo appears, the world 50,000 years ago. The daily life of the Neanderthal men. The built down forgery. Chapter 8 
the later Paleolithic age and the first men like ourselves. The coming of men like ourselves. The geography of the later Paleolithic age. The geography of the later Paleolithic world. The close of the Paleolithic age. No subman in America. The last Paleolithic man. Chapter 9 Neolithic Man The age of cultivation begins. Where did the Neolithic culture arise? Everyday Neolithic life Primitive trade, the flooding of the Mediterranean Valley, Chapter 10 Early Thought, Primitive Philosophy the old man in religion, fear and hope in religion, stars and seasons, storytelling and myth-making, complex origins of religion. Chapter 11 The Races of Mankind Is mankind still differentiating? The main races of mankind The brunette peoples, the so-called Heliolithic culture, the American Indians. Chapter 12 The Languages of Mankind No one primitive language. The Aryan languages, the Semitic languages, the Hamitic languages, the Ural Altic languages, Ural Altic languages. The Chinese languages, other language groups, a possible primitive language group, some isolated languages. Book 3 The First Civilizations Chapter 13 
the early empires, early cultivators, and early nomads. The Sumerians, the empire of Sargon the First, the empire of Hammurabi, the Assyrians and their empire, the Chaldean Empire, the early history of Egypt, the early civilizations of India, the early history of China, while the civilizations were growing. The Legend of Atlantis Chapter 14 Sea Peoples and Trading Peoples the earliest ships and sailors, the Aegean cities before history, the first voyages of exploration, early traders, early travelers, Chapter 15 Writing Picture Writing Syllable Writing Alphabet Writing The place of writing in human life. Chapter 16 Gods and Stars, Priests and Kings. The priest comes into history. Priests and the stars. Priests and the dawn of learning. King against priest. How Belmarduk struggled against the kings. The God Kings of Egypt Shi Huang Ti destroys the books Chapter 17 Serfs, Slaves, Social Classes, and Free Individuals The Common Man in Ancient Times The Earliest Slaves The first independent persons. Social classes 3000 years ago.
classes hardening into caste. Caste in India. The system of the mandarins. A summary of 10,000 years. Plastic and pictorial art in the ancient world. Literature, drama and music in the ancient world. Book 4 Judea, Greece, and India. Chapter 18 The Hebrew Scriptures and the Prophets. The place of Israelites in history. Saul, David, and Solomon. The Jews, a people of mixed origin. The importance of the Hebrew prophets. Chapter 19 The Aryan-speaking peoples in prehistoric times The spreading of the Aryan speakers About the original life of the Aryans the Aryan family. Chapter 20 The Greeks and the Persians the Hellenic peoples. Distinctive features of Hellenic civilization. Monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy in Greece. The kingdom of Lydia. The rise of the Persians in the east. The story of Croesus Darius invades Russia The Battle of Marathon Thermopylae and Salamis Plataea and Mycale. Chapter 21 Greek Thought, Literature and Art The Athens of Pericles, Socrates, Plato and the Academy, Aristotle and the Lyceum, 
philosophy becomes unworldly. The quality and limitations of Greek thought the first great imaginative literature, Greek art. Chapter 22 The Career of Alexander the Great Philip of Macedonia, the murder of King Philip, Alexander's first conquest, the wanderings of Alexander. Was Alexander indeed great? The successors of Alexander. Pergamum, a refuge of culture. Alexander as a portent of world unity. Chapter 23 Science and Religion at Alexandria The Science of Alexandria Philosophy of Alexandria Alexandria as a Factory of Religions Alexandria and India Chapter 24 The Rise and Spread of Buddhism The Story of Gautama Teaching and Legend in Conflict The Gospel of Gautama Buddha Buddhism and Ashoka Two Great Chinese Teachers The Corruptions of Buddhism The Present Range of Buddhism Book 5 Rise and Collapse of the Roman Empire Chapter 25 The Two Western Republics The Beginnings of the Latins A New Sort of State The Carthaginian Republic of Rich Men The First Punic War Cato the Elder and the Spirit of Cato The Second Punic War 
the Third Punic War, how the Punic Wars undermined Roman liberty, comparison of the Roman Republic with the modern state. Chapter 26 From Tiberius Gracchus to the God Emperor in Rome The Science of Thwarting the Common Man Finance in the Roman State the last years of Republican politics, the era of the adventurer generals, the end of the Republic, the coming of the princeps, why the Roman Republic failed. Chapter 27 The Caesars Between the Sea and the Great Plains A Short Catalogue of Emperors Roman Civilization at its Zenith Characteristics of Art under the Roman Empire a certain dullness of the Roman imagination, the stir of the great plains, the western true Roman Empire crumples up, the eastern revived Hellenic Empire. Book 6 Christianity and Islam Chapter 28 The Rise of Christianity and the Fall of the Western Empire Judea at the Christian era The teachings of Jesus of Nazareth The new universal religions The crucifixion of Jesus of Nazareth Doctrines added to the teachings of Jesus, the struggles and persecutions of Christianity, Constantine the Great, the establishment of official Christianity, The Map of Europe, A.D. 500 The Salvation of Learning by Christianity Byzantine Art Chapter 29 The history of Asia during the decay 
of Western and Byzantine empires. Justinian the Great The Sassanid Empire in Persia The decay of Syria under the Sassanids The first message from Islam Zoroaster and Mani Hunnish peoples in Central Asia and India, the dynasties of Han and Tang in China, the intellectual fetters of China, early Chinese art, the travels of Yuan Chuang, Chapter 30 Muhammad and Islam Arabia before Muhammad Life of Muhammad to the Hajira Muhammad becomes a fighting prophet. The teachings of Islam The Caliphs Abu Bakr and Omar The great days of Omayyads The decay of Islam under the Abbasids Arabic culture Arabic art Chapter 31 Christendom and the Crusades. The Western world at its lowest ebb. The feudal system. The Frankish kingdom of the Merovingians. Christianization of the Western Barbarians Charlemagne becomes Emperor of the West The personality of Charlemagne Romanesque architecture and art Volume 2 
the French and the Germans become distinct. The Normans, the Saracens, the Hungarians and the Seljuk Turks How Constantinople appealed to Rome, the Crusades, the Crusades a test of Christianity, the Emperor Frederick the second defects and limitations of the papacy, a list of leading popes, Gothic architecture and art, medieval music. Book 7 The Mongol Empires of the Landways and the New Empires of the Seaways Chapter 32 The Great Empire of Genghis Khan and his successors, the age of the landways, Asia at the end of the twelfth century, The rise and victories of the Mongols, the travels of Marco Polo, the Ottoman Turks and Constantinople. Why the Mongols were not Christianized The Yuan and Ming dynasties in China, the Mongols revert to tribalism, the Kipchak Empire and the Tsar of Muscovy, Timurlane. The Mughal Empire of India, the Gypsies. Chapter 33 The Renaissance of Western Civilization, Landways Give Place to the Seaways. Christianity and Popular Education Europe begins to think for itself The Great Plague and the Dawn of Communism How paper liberated the human mind. Protestantism of the princes and the Protestantism of the peoples. The reawakening of science. 
the new growth of European towns, the literary renaissance, the artistic renaissance. America comes into history. What Machiavelli thought of the world. The Republic of Switzerland. The life of Emperor Charles V. Protestants, if the prince wills it. The intellectual undertow. Book 8 The Age of Great Powers Chapter 34 Princes, Parliaments and Powers Princes and Foreign Policy The Dutch Republic The English Republic The breakup and disorder of Germany, the splendors of grand monarchy in Europe, music in the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries, seventeenth and eighteenth century paintings. The growth of the idea of great powers, the crowned republic of Poland and its fate, the first scramble for empire overseas, Britain dominates India. Russia's ride to the Pacific. What Gibbon thought of the world in 1780. The social truce draws to an end. Chapter 35 The New Democratic Republics of America and France Inconveniences of the Great Power System The Thirteen Colonies before their revolt. Civil war is forced upon the colonies. The war of independence. The constitution of the United States. Primitive features of the United States Constitution Revolutionary ideas in France The revolution of the year 1789 
the French Crown Republic of 8991, the revolution of the Jacobins, the Jacobin Republic 1792 to 94, the Directory, the pause in reconstruction and the dawn of modern socialism, Chapter 36 The Career of Napoleon Bonaparte The Bonaparte family in Corsica The Bonaparte as a Republican general Napoleon First Consul 1799 to 1804 Napoleon I, Emperor, 1804 to 1814 The Hundred Days The Map of Europe in 1815 Empire Style Chapter 37 The Realities and Imaginations of the 19th Century The Mechanical Revolution Relation of the Mechanical to the Industrial Revolution The Fermentation of Ideas 1848 The Development of the Idea of Socialism How Darwinism Affected Religious and Political Ideas the idea of nationalism. The Great Exhibition of 1851. The career of Napoleon III. Lincoln and the Civil War in America. The Russo-Turkish War and the Treaty of Berlin The Second Scramble for Overseas Empire The Indian Precedent in Asia The History of Japan Close of the period of overseas expansion, the British Empire in 1914, painting and sculpture and architecture, music in the 19th century, the rise of the novel to predominance in literature, Chapter 38 The Catastrophe of Modern Imperialism The Armed Peace Before the First World War Imperial Germany The Spirit of Imperialism in Britain and Ireland 
imperialism in France, Italy and the Balkans, Russia a grand monarchy, the United States and the imperial idea, the immediate causes of the First World War, the summary of the First World War up to 1917, the First World War from the Russian collapse to the armistice. Chapter 39 20 years of indecision and its outcome a phase of moral exhaustion, President Wilson at Versailles, Constitution of the League of Nations, Treaties of 1919-1920, to 1920, Bolshevism in Russia, the Irish Free State, the Far and Near East, Debts, Money and Stabilization, The Great Crash of 1929, The Spanish Tragedy, The Rise of Nazism, The World Slides to War, The Second World War. Chapter 40 After the Second World War The United Nations The Technological Explosion The Population Explosion The Vanishing of Empires The Expansion of Communism the control and suppression of knowledge in communist countries, the control and suppression of knowledge in the Western world, the years of conflict, chronological table, key to pronunciation, Index End of the reading of contents From the Outline of History by H.G. Wells List of maps and illustrations follows. This has been a recording for Vox Olympia audiobooks. Our audiobooks are available as podcasts on Anchor.fm, Spotify, Google and Apple Podcasts. Look for Vox Olympia audiobooks. Our reading recordings are made for the benefit of the blind, the reading disabled children of the world, and everyone else interested in our selection of books. Our reading recordings are made possible by the generous endowment of the BLA Mawati Literary Arts Foundation. We thank our listeners for tuning in today on August. 21st, 2022, for a reading of the Outline of History by H. E. Wells. Thanks.
Hello and welcome to Vox Olympia Book Readings. Our book reading recordings are made for the benefit of the blind, the reading disabled, children of the world, and everyone else interested in our book selections. Our reading recordings are conducted at the studios of the Beale Himavati Literary Arts Foundation. Our reading recordings are made accessible on Vox Olympia audiobook podcasts through Anchor.fm, Spotify, Apple, and Google Apps. On this day, the 23rd of August, 2022, with recordings from the book, The Outline of History by H.G. Wells. The Outline of History by H.G. Wells. List of Maps and Illustrations. The Drifting Continents Life in the Early Paleozoic Australian Lungfish Life in the Later Paleozoic Some Reptiles of the Late Paleozoic Age Some Mesozoic Reptiles Pterodactyls and Archaeopteryx, Late Mesozoic Reptiles, Hesperonis, Hesperornis, Some Oligocene Mammals, Some Oligocene Mammals, Miocene mammals, early Pleistocene animals, and contemporary with earliest man, Australopithecus, the subman Pithecanthropus, Europe and Western Asia, fifty thousand years ago, Neanderthal man. Early stone implements, the built down subman, Cro Magnon man, reindeer age articles, a reindeer age masterpiece, Europe and Western Asia in the later Paleolithic age. Reindeer age engravings and carvings. Diagram of estimated duration of the true human periods. Australia and the Western Pacific in the glacial age map. Neolithic implements. Pottery from lake dwellings. Hut urns. A menhir of the Neolithic period, Bronze Age implements, diagram showing the duration of the Neolithic period, heads of Australoid types, Bushwoman, Negro types, Caucasian types. Mongolian types, the swastika, Europe, Asia, Africa, 15,000 years ago, map, relationship of human races, diagrammatic summary, possible development of languages, The Cradle of Western Civilization 
6000 to 4000 BC map Sumerian warriors and phalanx Assyrian warrior palace of Sargon the second racial types from Egyptian tomb paintings the cradle of Chinese civilization map boats on the Nile 250 BC Egyptian ship on the Red Sea 1250 BC Asian civilization map American Indian picture writing a votary of the snake goddess Egyptian hippopotamus goddess Egyptian gods Set, Anubis, Typhoon, and Bess. Egyptian gods, Thoth Lunis, Hathor, and Chenumu. Knemu. An Assyrian king and his chief minister, Pharaoh Shephrin. Pharaoh Ramses III as Osiris, Sacrophagus Relief, Pharaoh Akhnaton, Egyptian Peasants, Pyramid Age, Brawl among Egyptian Boatmen, Pyramid Age, Egyptian Social Types from Tombs, Time Chart, 6000 BC to AD The Land of the Hebrews Map Aryan speaking people 1000 to 500 BC Map Combat between Menelaus and Hector Archaic horses and chariots Hellenic races, 1000 to 800 BC map, Greek sea fight, 550 BC, Athenian warship, 400 BC, Median and Second Babylonian empires in Nebuchadnezzar's reign, map. Scythian types, the Empire of Darius map, Wars of the Greeks and Persians map, Athenian foot soldier, Persian bodyguard from Phrase at Susa, the world according to Herodotus map. Athene of the Parthenon, Philip of Macedon, Growth of Macedonia under Philip, Map, Macedonian warrior, Bas relief from Pella, Campaigns of Alexander the Great, Map, Alexander the Great. Breaking of Alexander's Empire, map. Seleucus I, later state of Alexander's Empire, map. The world according to Eratosthenes, 200 BC, map. The known world, 250 BC, map. Isis and Horus, Serapis, The Rise of Buddhism, Map, Hariti, Chinese Image of Quan Yin, The Spread of Buddhism, Map, Indian Gods, 
Vishnu Brahma Shiva Indian Gods Krishna Kali Ganesha The Western Mediterranean 800 to 600 BC map The Early Latium map Burning the Dead Etruscan Ceremony Roman power after the Samnite Wars map Italy after 275 BC map Roman coins celebrating the victory of Ophirus Mercury Carthaginian coins Roman as Rome and its alliance, 150 BC, map, gladiators, Roman power, 50 BC, map, Julius Caesar, Roman Empire at death of Augustus, AD 14, map, Roman Empire in time of Trajan, map, Asia and Europe, life of the historical period, map, Central Asia, 200 to 100 BC, map, tracks of migrating and raiding peoples, AD 1 to 700, map, Eastern Roman Empire, map, Constantinople, map, to show value of its position, Galilee map Europe AD 500 map the Eastern Empire and the Sassanids map Asia Minor Syria and Mesopotamia map Ephthalite coin Chinese Empire Tang Dynasty map Yuan Chuang's route from China to India map Arabia and adjacent countries map The beginnings of Muslim power map The growth of Muslim power in 25 years map The Muslim Empire AD 750 map Muhammad and the Angel Gabriel Europe AD 500 map Frankish dominions in the time of Charles Martel, map. England, AD 640, map. England, AD 878, map. Europe at the death of Charlemagne, map. France at the close of the 10th century, map. Empire of Otto the Great map, the coming of the Seljuks map, the First Crusade map, Europe and Asia 1200 map, Empire of Chinggis Khan 1227 map, Travels of Marco Polo map, Ottoman Empire 1453 map, Ottoman Empire 1566 map, Empire of Timurlane map Europe at the fall of Constantinople map We have the pain John Ball's speech Ignatius of Loyola European trade routes in the 14th century map Chief voyages of exploration up to 1522 map Mexico and Peru map Switzerland map Europe in the time of Charles V map Martin Luther Francis I Henry VIII Charles V Central Europe 1648 map Louis XIV Europe in 1714 map, 
partitions of Poland maps, Britain, France, and Spain in America 1750 map, chief foreign settlements in India 17th century map, India in 1750 map, American colonies 1760 map, Boston 1775 map, the USA showing dates of chief terrestrial extensions map, the USA in 1790 map, Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, the flight to Varennes map, not eastern frontier of France 1792 map, Napoleon's Egyptian campaign map, Napoleon as emperor, Tsar Alexander I, Napoleon's Empire 1810 map, Trail of Napoleon map, Europe after the Congress of Vienna map, the natural political map of Europe, tribal gods of the 19th century, Europe 1848 to 1871 map, Italy 1861 map, Bismarck, the Balkans 1878 map, the comparative maps of Asia in different projections, the British Empire in 1815 map, Africa in the middle of the 19th century map, Africa 1914 map, Japan and the east coast of Asia map, Overseas Empire of European Powers 1914 map, Emperor William II, Ireland map, the Balkan states 1913 map, the original German plan 1914 map, the Western Front 1915 to 1918 map, the time chart of the First World War 1914 to 1918 Western, time chart of the First World War 1914 to 1918 Eastern. President Wilson, Monsieur Clemenceau, Mr. Lloyd George, Germany after the Peace Treaty 1919 map, Breakup of Austria Hungary map, The Turkish Treaty 1920 map, The Growth of Hitler's Reich map, the Berlin-Rome Axis, 1936 map, Spring, 1940 map, the German invasion of Russia map, the invasion of Normandy map, Southern Asia, 1939 map, States of Southern Asia, 1959 map, Africa 1939 map, African States 1960 map, Southern Africa mid 1969, Communist States of Europe and Asia 1959 map. End of the list of illustrations and maps. In the book, The Outline of History, by H. E. Wells. The Outline of History was first written in 1918 to 1919. It was published in illustrated parts and it was carefully revised and printed again as a book in 1920. <clears throat> 
was again revised very severely and rearranged for a reprint in 1923 January. It was reissued in a revised and much more amply illustrated edition in 1925 and again in 1930 came a quite fresh edition recast and rewritten in many places and with much added new matter. This edition was further revised in 1939. There were many reasons to move a writer to attempt a world history in 1918. It was the last, the weariest, the most disillusioned year of the First World War. Everywhere there were unwanted privations, Everywhere there was mourning. The tale of the dead and the mutilated had mounted to many millions. Men felt they had come back to a crisis in the world affairs. They were too weary and heartsick to consider complicated possibilities. They were not sure whether they were facing a disaster to civilization or the inauguration of a new phase of human association. They saw things with the simplicity of such flat alternatives and they clung to hope. And they clung to hope. There was a copious discussion of possible new arrangements of world politics, of world treaties, for abolition of war. Of leagues, of leagues of nations, of leagues of peoples. Everyone was thinking internationally, or at least trying to do so. But there was a widespread realization that everywhere, the essentials of the huge problems that had been thrust so suddenly and tragically upon the democracies of the world were insufficiently understood. How had these things come about? they asked, trying to probe behind the disputes about Sarajevo and the Belgian scrap of paper to the broader, remoter causes of things. What were the beginnings of this tragic feud across the Rhine? Why had it come to affect the whole world? Why was Japan, which half a century ago had been a romantic, picturesque country, a legend of flimsy art and comic opera land, as remote as almost another planet, now patrolling the Mediterranean with great battleships. Why had Sardom vanished like a dream? What in truth was Turkey? Why was Constantinople so important in the world? What was an empire? How did empires begin? What had converted Germany from a diversity of little states into one aggressive will and power and put the fear of German energy into half mankind? Men and women tried to recall the narrow history teaching of their brief school days and found an uninspiring and partially forgotten list of national kings or presidents. They tried to read about these matters and found an endless wilderness of books. They had been taught history, they found, in nationalist blinkers, ignoring every country but their own, and now they were turned out into a blaze. It was extraordinarily difficult for them to determine the relative values of matters under discussion. Multitudes of people, all the intelligent people in the world, indeed, who were not already specifically instructed, were seeking more or less consciously to get the hang of the world affairs as a whole. They were in fact improvising outlines of history in their minds 
for their own use. The writer is not any profession in any professional sense, an historian, but he has been making out his own private outline from the beginnings of his career. He's always been preoccupied with history as one whole and with the general forces that make history. The writer is not in any professional sense an historian, but he has been making out in his own private outline from the beginnings of his career. He has always been preoccupied with history as one whole and with general forces that make history. It is the twist of his mind. Even when he was a science student, he kept a notebook for historical reading. His first published story, The Time Machine, 1894, was a fantastic speculation about the trend of human destiny. When the sleeper awakes was a picturesque exaggeration of the development of our civilization. Anticipations, 1900, was an attempt to argue out some possible consequences of current processes. In quite a number of his books, in the research magnificent and the undying fire for example little outlines of history are vignetted and so this mental stir of the wartime found him if not specially equipped at least specially disposed to take a comprehensive view of past and present things for some time before he began this outline, he had been working upon the problems of after-war settlements and the project of a League of Nations. In the days, that is, before the late President Wilson took possession of that proposal, such work necessarily involved participation in the disputes an organization of various propagandist unions and societies. The discussions in these associations brought out very vividly the vital importance in all political activities of a man's conception of the past. For indeed, what are a man's political activities but the expression in action of his ideas of the past, all the people who were interested in these League of Nation projects were at sixes and sevens among themselves because they had the most vague, heterogeneous and untidy assumptions of what the world of men was and what it had been and therefore what it could be. In very many cases, they were extraordinarily exact special knowledge combined with the most crude and naive assumptions about history in general. It seemed more and more advisable to the writer to get together maps and nodes and read rather more systematically than he had hitherto done and clear up for himself a number of historical issues upon which he was extremely still vague. As soon as he had embarked upon this, it became evident to him that he might do much more useful work by developing his private memoranda upon the main shapes of history into a sort of general report and handbook for the use of men and women busier than himself or preoccupied with other things than by wrangling more and more hopelessly over impossible constitutions for improbable world confederations. 
The more he entertained this project of writing a review of existing knowledge of man's place and space and time, the more difficult, attractive, and unavoidable an undertaking it appeared to him. To begin with, he had contemplated a general review of European unity, a sort of summary of the rise and breakup of the Roman system of the obstinate survival of the idea of empire in Europe, of the various projects for the unification of Christendom that had been put forward at different times. But it was speedily evident that there was no real beginnings of things in Rome or in Judea and no possibility of confining the story to the Western world. There was that much was only the latter act of a much greater drama. He found the story carrying him back on one hand to the Aryan beginnings in the forests and plains of Europe and Western Asia, and on the other to the earlier stages of civilization in Egypt and Mesopotamia, and the now submerged lands that seem once to have sustained a human population in the Mediterranean basin. He began to realize how severely European historians had minimized the share of central uplands of Asia and of Persia, the Indian and the Chinese cultures in the drama of mankind. He began to see more and more plainly how living the remote past still is in our lives and institutions and how little we can understand either the broad political or religious or social issues of today without some understanding of the earlier stages of human association. That involves some understanding of human origins. So the outline spread and enlarged itself as he contemplated it. For a time, he hesitated before the epic immensity of his broadening task. He asked himself whether this was rather not a work for a historian than for one whose chief writing sedato had been either speculative essays or works of fiction. But there did not seem to be any historian available who was sufficiently superficial, shall we say, sufficiently wide and sufficiently shallow to cover the vast field of the project. Historians are for most part very scholarly men nowadays. They go in fear rather of small errors than of disconnectedness. They dread the certain ridicule of a wrong date more than the disputable attribution of a wrong value. It is right and proper that this should be so, and that in a hasty and headlong age, a whole class of devoted men should maintain an exacting standard of fine precisions. But these high standards of detailed accuracy make it hopeless for us to go to the historians of what is required here. For them, this would not be an attractive task, but a distressing task. To them, one must look for accumulated material rather than for assembled and massed effects. They are indeed giving us now, in numerous volumes, by many hands, from many points of view, and in a pleasing diversity of spirit and intention, great and noble compilations of extreme value to students. But these magnificent performances are, for everyday purposes of the ordinary citizen traveling about in life, as impressive and as useful for handy guidance as a many-volume encyclopedia. 
In America, indeed, there were to be found several useful small books on universal history, notably the ancient and modern history of Robinson and Breasted and Hutton Webster's and W. M. West's similar volumes. But these writers aim at the school and the college rather than at the general reader. The Living Past of F. S. Marvin, again, is an admirable essay on intellectual progress, but it gives little substantial fact. It would indeed have meant disaster to the academic reputation of any established historical authority to have admitted an intention of writing a complete outline of history. And even were that promise given, the general reader would still have to wait many years for its performance. The standing of the present writer, however, who is by nature and choice as remote from academic respect as he is from dukedom, enabled him to interest the public in history without any sacrifice of dignity and distinction such as such risks from hostile criticism as a recognized authority would have had to incur. The standing of the present writer, however, who is by nature and choice as remote from academic respect as he is from a dukedom, enabled him to interest the public in history without any such sacrifice of dignity and distinction, such risks from hostile criticism as a recognized authority would have had to incur. It was his happy privilege to offend inaccessibly. He is a literary Bedouin whose home is the great outside who knows no prouder title than his name whose only conceivable honor is his own. This or that specialist might rage at a scandalous neglect of this or that precious item of that specialist monopoly. It would not matter very much. He would go unblushingly to standard works and accessible material ordinarily. He was not even obliged to pretend to original discoveries or original points of view. His simpler undertaking was to collect, arrange, determine the proportion of the parts and phases of the great adventure of mankind and write. He has added nothing to history. At least he hopes he has added nothing to history. He has merely made a digest of a great mass of material, some of it very new material, and he has done so in the character of a popular writer considering the needs of other ordinary citizens like himself. Yet the subject is so splendid, a one that no possible treatment, however unpretending, can rob it altogether of its sweeping greatness and dignity. If sometimes this outline is labored and pitifully insufficient, at others it seems almost to have planned and written itself. Its background is unfathomable mystery, the riddle of the stars, the measurelessness of space and time. There appears life struggling towards consciousness, gathering power, accumulating will through millions of years and through countless billions of individual lives until it reaches the tragic confusions and perplexities of the world of today, so full of fear and yet so full of promise and opportunity. We see man rising from lonely beginnings to this present day of world fellowship, we see all human institutions grow and change. They are changing now more rapidly than they have ever done before. 
The display ends in a tremendous note of interrogation. The writer is just a guide who brings his reader at last to the present age, the advancing age of things, and stops and whispers beside him, This is our inheritance. It would be absurd to claim that this outline is anything more than a current rendering of the opening visions of reality through the multitudinous activities of geologists, paleontologists, embryologists, and every kind of naturalist, psychologist, ethnologist, archaeologist, philologist, and historical investigators have unveiled during the last 100 years. History a century ago was more mere bookishness. The bookish historian now accepts reluctantly and ungraciously enough his place as a mere contributor of doubtful documents to the broad ensemble. If on this huge prospect our outline makes its report, then to the best of the writer's ability this is how the vision looks today but he writes within his own limitations and the limitations of his time the outline is a book of today with no pretensions to immortality it is the current account the outline of history in 1931 will in due course follow its earlier additions to the second-hand book box and the dust destructor. More gifted hands with fuller information and ampler means will presently write fresh outlines and happier phrases. The outline of history the writer would prefer to his own would be the outline of 2031. To read it and perhaps with even more curiosity to pour over its illustrations. The outline of history the writer would far prefer to his own would be the outline of 2031. To read it and perhaps with even more curiosity to pour over its illustrations. All of us, if by some miracle we could get that copy of Outline of History for 2031, would, I suppose, turn first to the amazing illustrations of the last chapters and then to the accompanying text. What astonishing events! What unbelievable achievements! But afterwards, this writer, at least, would go back to the early chapters to see how much of the story that is told here survived. Probably, the general shape of the early part would still be very much the same. But there would be hundreds of illuminating details, now unknown and fascinating additional discoveries of skulls, implements, buried cities, and vestiges of lost and submerged peoples. As yet unsuspected, the stories of China and India would be much more exact and perhaps different in quality, and much more would be known of Central Asia and perhaps of America before Columbus. Charlemagne and Caesar would still be great figures in history and some of our nearer giants, Napoleon for example, might be found shrunken to comparative unimportance. The chief purpose of the revision of 1930 was to make the outline 
simpler and easier to read. The writer has told how it grew out of notes and maps and he will confess that now when he turns over the earlier editions, the first edition that was published in parts in the first book edition of 1920, he finds the flavor of notebooks altogether too strong. Much undigested and discordant matter was put into footnotes. There were too many hesitating, ambiguous, guarded statements. The presentation was sometimes confused. The method he pursued led naturally to that. He called in to his aid four chief helpers, Sir Ray Lancaster, Professor Gilbert Murray, Sir Harry Johnston and Mr. Ernest Bake Barker and he made them his advisors upon his readings and sources of information. In addition, he secured the help and advice of various specially spe well-read men upon this or that point of re or region, Sir Denison Ross, Mr. Cranmer Bing, Mr. S. N. Fu, for example, were extremely helpful in regard to Central Asia and China. Dr. Charles Singer gave the most useful information upon classical science. Professor J. L. Myries was a valuable source for Mediterranean archaeology. Mr. Philip Gadea was his counselor upon European politics in the 18th and early 19th century, and so forth and so on. Mr. J. F. Horbin with his genius for political and commercial geography was not much was not so much an illustrator as a collaborator. There were many others who gave their time and knowledge freely and generously. There were full lists of names in previous editions. One hesitates between acknowledging one's obligation and implicating one's friends. Each chapter was drafted by the author. Multiple copies were made and sent out to possible helpers who wrote, commentated, slashed about upon them as they thought proper. The author then sat down, chastened and instructed, amidst these mutilated and butchered duplicates, wrote his chapter afresh. Final proofs went out to all the chief helpers and to anyone else especially interested in the period dealt with. In this way, the correctness of names, dates and so forth was ensured. But though the writer, upon all questions of fact, followed with absolute fidelity the band of tutors he had evoked, he reserved to himself the fullest rights of private judgment upon matters of opinion. The result was the introduction of various lively controversies into the clustering footnotes and even into the text. For example, he fell foul of Professor Gilbert Murray in comparison of the moral and intellectual quality of the common Athenian and of the Cockney, and though he conceded to his editor that the completest intimacy with the former, he maintained his right to judge the latter in his own fashion. There was also a page or so of disputation between the writer, Professor Murray, and Mr. Barker about the soundness of Mr. Gladstone's education and various differences with Mr. Ernest Barker. To the writer, the greatest of Napoleon I is a monstrous and altogether unsubstantial superstition. The facts, he thinks, speaks for themselves, and they will be given in this outline in their proper place and proportion. The man was of the quality of Mussolini and intellectually inferior to Napoleon III. But Mr. Barker was unable to accept the statement. Put me down of the opposite opinion, he wrote 
and so the footnote stood. Sir Harry Johnston's weakness, or rather his excessive strength, lay in the abnormal, though no doubt righteous spelling of well-known historical names. He would have Solomon, Shalomon, and Hebrews, Ibrim, which seemed likely to be difficult and confusing for the ordinary reader. That issue also flowered into footnotes. These footnotes were as amusing to the writer as his friends, as family jokes, and they were almost inevitable while the names of four chief helpers stood with the writers upon the title page upholding and in a way guaranteeing it, but they were perplexing and tedious to most readers. Footnotes, references and qualifications are necessary things in a book written for the student, but in this outline they were superfluous and even the writer now confesses a little pretentious. In this edition, he releases his four chief helpers with gratitude from all further responsibility. Their names disappear from the title page. He drops his pilots. They have steered him past dangerous shoals and along tortuous channels to his present freedom and confidence. And so helped and liberated, he is able to simplify, clarify and give to its fullest values to this great story, their kindness made it possible for him to tell. The 1930 edition was the sixth complete reprinting of this work. The first publication in parts subjected it chapter by chapter to the scrutiny of over 100,000 readers. Many wrote offering comments, pointing out small errors, raising interesting points. All this correspondence was dealt with systematically and the first book edition benefited greatly in detail. That also went out to a great multitude of readers. In America alone, over a quarter of a million copies were issued, and that again produced an abundant crop of emendations. That edition also evoked many able reviews and several critical pamphlets appeared. The second book edition In 1923, the third edition, that is, profited greatly by that second extensive examination. In addition to such revisions of detail, the chapters of the third edition were rearranged. For some time, the author had felt that his account of the Aryan culture came too early and minimized the share of the non-Aryan folk in the development of civilization. He altered the order of the earlier chapters so as to correct this effect and also he inserted a fuller account of Lincoln and the American Civil War. The edition of 1930 involved still further additions and revisions. It has been purged of footnotes and digressions and made more explicit and more fluent and more continuous than its predecessors. The disputes of the collaborators are no longer heard from behind the scenes. It has, the writer hopes, lost its last traces of the student's notebook and has become plainly and simply an outline of history. The reader of this book need be no doubt about the facts the names, the dates that are given here, 
after the test of these scrutinies and revisions, the book has been severely criticized, but never on the score of its general accuracy. Even so inveterate an antagonist of the writer as Mr. Belloc has conceded that it has much merit. The objections made concerns the relative prominence given to this part of that, to the influence of this culture, the importance of that. A certain type of classical scholar rages at the comparative neglect of Homer and the aesthetic side of Greek life, though the account of Greek science is full, and though the intellectual development of Greece is treated as a cardinal phase in human development. Now the large body of opinion sees the world through Latin forms and is exasperated even by the simple statement of comparative extent, duration and influence of, for instance, the Byzantine, the Persian and Chinese systems. Rome is still aggressive in modern literature and criticism and still seeks to minimize the non-Latin spaces in the picture. Dogmatic freethinkers again consider the acceptance of Jesus as a real person insupportable. Adherents of Islam cry out against the too familiar handling of their prophet. Communists are offended because of the doctrines of Marx and Lenin, are not made the basis of the entire story. Many people with a rather materialistic theology in their minds, have been disagreeably impressed by the massed and accumulating evidences of man's animal descent. Even if that be true, they think it highly demoralizing. Such criticisms were inevitable. There was no way of evading or satisfying these demands. One realizes, in the face of such attitudes and objections, that nearly everyone has already a sort of implicit outline of history in his mind, his working explanation of his world and of his place in the world, rejecting this view and assuming that, and more or less Clear-mindedly, he brings our version to the test of these half-buried acceptances. And naturally, the writer too has his views, his bias. But the reader will find a writer who has not that much personality. There will never be an outline of history that is not tendential. Here, as in every sort of descriptive and informative book, the reader has to bear in mind, just as a judge or a juryman has to bear in mind, the individual characteristics of the witness who is giving his account of what he saw. What is claimed here is the witness does, does to the best of his ability tender a fair and honest general account from his point of view of the great spectacle of time and fate that has unfolded itself before him. In the criticism of the earlier editions of this outline, the complaint was frequently repeated that the development of the arts, particularly of music, was disregarded, the story of man's achievement of knowledge and social power was given at considerable length but hardly anything was said of the appearance and extension of his conscious search of beauty. An attempt has been made since 1930 to meet these objections and sections have been added to record how the artist, the poet, and the imaginative writer appeared in human life. Yet the limitations upon any history of music or any other art are very narrow. 
one may note the appearance of new forms, new methods, new instruments, but the only way to the realization of imaginative art is to hear it, or see it, or read it. It is no part of our plan to catalogue masters and masterpieces and help our readers to babble great names. Additions have been made necessary by the progress of the excavator. It is hard nowadays for the writer to keep pace with the spade. Moreover, it has been necessary to scrutinize the account of the First World War closely and to rearrange and, in part, rewrite the post-war portion. That was much the weakest part of the preceding editions. The exciting hopes and stresses of the time were too close for restrained writing. There was a lack of proportion between this conclusion and the rest of the book. Speeches of Mr. Lloyd George, the perfidies of the Irish struggle, lectures by obscure generals at the United Service Institution loomed portentous. portentous. Something of the pamphleteer, something of the partisan came in. This latter part has been severely pruned and a fresh attempt to give a sounder analysis of this world outlook has been made. It is not only in the political field that things have had to be thought out again. The nature of financial and economic difficulties of the world has become much plainer now than it was before the crises of 1929, and this again has necessitated very careful revision. H. G. Wells, 1939. 4. The preceding sections are left as Wells wrote them, and with only such changes as are necessary to make sense after the passing of the years, he intended to make a further serious revision. At intervals, as the preface shows, he added sections to bring the outline up to date, but they were episodic and had faults of which he was probably conscious. Certainly there exists a copy which he had begun to correct and in which everything about 1930 is struck out in the table of contents, in which everything after about 1930 is struck out in the table of contents. All his detailed corrections have, of course, been incorporated in my revision. The most interesting of them are those that show a modification of his views upon the Russian Revolution. Several of the more offensive adjectives had been removed. In my revision, I have found practically nothing of importance to alter up to the date which he had made his great crossing out. Where I have had to change anything previously, it has always been because of an alter alteration in our knowledge, not because of an error. The planet Pluto has been discovered and so have several fossil men. The British Queen is no longer Empress of India, and therefore some phrases have had to be modified. That is all. The monumentally solid quality of the body of the work has been only proved by time. In later years, I have naturally had to make more changes but I have always endeavoured to remember where doubt exists, the reader, the readers wish to hear the views of Wells and not of Postgate. For that reason, I have sometimes let stand judgments that would 
not be my own. I have also had to rewrite the whole section which Wells had merely sketched out. Those who are interested may note that much of section 7 and all of section 9 and 12 of chapter 39 are from my hand and that the account of the Second World War is wholly my own. All the rest is substantially H.G. Wells's. R. W. Postgate, 1949 5. The outline has been revised and updated in 1956, 1961, and now again in 1969. I was helped in the later versions by G. P. Wells, H.G.'s zoologist's son, who undertook the revision of earlier chapters, broadly speaking, of the ages before the beginnings of recorded history. Like myself, he has altered the text only on points of fact, and when recent discoveries have made such alteration unavoidable. Chapter 40 of 1969 edition was written by myself except for sections 2 and 3 dealing with current explosions which are by GPW, GP Wells. We have of course criticized and discussed each other's contribution before they assumed their final form. R.W. Postgate, 1969. Raymond Postgate had corrected the proofs of the present revision before his death in March 1971. Accept the advantage has been taken of publication delays to make one or two minor updatings. The text is printed as it left our hands in the summer of 1969. G. P. Wells, 1971. End of a end of the reading of the introduction of the outline of history, its story and aim by H. G. Wells. This has been a recording for Vox Olympia audiobooks. Our audiobooks are available as podcasts on Anchor.fm, Spotify, Google, and Apple Apps. Our reading recordings are conducted at, at the studios of the BL Hemavati Literary Arts Foundation. Our reading recordings are made for the benefit of the blind, the reading disabled, children of the world, and everyone else interested in our selection of books. We thank our listeners for tuning in this day, the 23rd of August, for this reading of the Outline of History by H.G. Wells. Thanks and bye-bye. Hello and welcome to Vox Olympia Book Readings. Our reading recordings are made for the benefit of the blind, the reading disabled, children of the world, and everyone else interested in our selection of books. Our reading recordings tonight are conducted at the BL Hemavati Literary Arts Foundation. Our recordings are made accessible at Vox Olympia Audiobook Podcast on Anchor.fm, Spotify, Google, and Apple Apps. On this day, the 24th of August, 2022, we continue with our readings from the book, The Outline of History, by H.G. Wells. We thank our listeners for tuning in.
The Outline of History by H. G. Wells Book 1 The World Before Man Chapter 1 The Earth in Space and Time 1. The Great Expansion of Men's Ideas of Space and Time 2. The Earth in Space 3. How long has Earth endured? 4. Are there other worlds among the stars? 1. And first, before we begin the history of life, let us tell something of the stage upon which our drama is put and of the background against which it is played. In the last few hundred years, there has been an extraordinary enlargement of men's ideas about the visible universe in which they live. At the same time, there has been perhaps a certain diminution in their individual self-importance. They have learned that they are items in a whole far, far vaster, more enduring and more wonderful than their ancestors ever dreamt or suspected. To the savage and primitive mind, the earth seems to be the whole flat floor of the universe. The sky is a dome above it across which the sun and the moon and the stars pass and pass again, returning by some mysterious roundabout or subterranean route The Babylonian and Chinese astronomers, after many centuries of star observation, still believed that the earth was flat. It was the Greek mind which first grasped clearly the spher spherical form of the world, but even so, it did not apprehend the universe as relatively very large. The globe of the earth was the center of being. The sun, the moon, the planets, the fixed stars moved about it as their center in crystalline spheres. It was only in the 15th century that men's minds moved beyond this and Copernicus made his amazing guess that the sun was the center and not the earth. It was only with the development of the telescope by Galileo in the opening of the 17th century that the views of Copernicus became widely accepted. The development of the telescope marks indeed a new phase in human thought, a new vision of life.
It is an extraordinary thing that the Greeks, with their lively and penetrating minds, never realized the possibilities of either microscope or telescope. They made no use of the lens, yet they lived in a world in which glass had been known and had been made beautiful for hundreds of years. They had about them glass flasks and bottles through which they must have caught glimpses of things distorted and enlarged. But science in Greece was pursued by philosophers in an aristocratic spirit Men who, with a few such exceptions as the ingenious Archimedes and Hero, were too proud to learn from such mere artisans as jewelers and metal and glass workers. Ignorance is the first penalty of pride. The philosopher had no mechanical skill and the artisan had no philosophical education and it was left for another age, more than a thousand years later, to bring together glass and the astronomer. Since the time of Galileo astronomy and the telescope have advanced together and a veil of ignorance and false assumptions has been rolled back from the deeps of space. The idea that the sun was the center of the universe has followed the idea that the world was in that position. We now know that our sun cannot even be included among the greatest of the stars. It is merely one of the lesser lights. The telescope released the human imagination as no other instrument had done. Two centuries later came the spectroscope, which breaks up visible light into its component colors. brighter and darker lines in the resulting rainbow give information about the composition of the light source and of any vapors through which light has passed on its way to the observer. Even movements of the source can be measured by this means. In the last two decades, new instruments have made a much wider spectrum available for analysis. Gigantic radio telescopes detect jets of radio waves from exploding stars and other centers of violent disturbances. Other instruments mounted on the moon or on man-made satellites to avoid the fogging effect of our atmosphere detect ultraviolet light, x-rays and gamma rays. So now a man can sit in laboratories and learn the composition and temperature of stars 
as far away as the limit of the visible universe and can measure distances that would take thousands of millions of years to travel even if one could move with the speed of light. The curtain that hid the unfathomable abyss of stellar distances has been drawn back only in the last three centuries. Still more recent is our realization of the immense duration of our universe in time. Among ancient peoples, the Indian philosophers alone seem to have had any perception of the vast ages through which existence is passed. In the European world, until little more than a century and a half ago, men's ideas of the time things had lasted were astonishingly brief. In the Universal History, published by a syndicate of booksellers in London in 1779, it is stated that the world was created in 4004 BC and with a pleasant exactitude at the autumnal equinox and that the making of man crowned the work of creation at Eden upon the Euphrates, exactly two days' journey about Basra. The confidence of these statements arose from a too literal interpretation of the Bible narrative. Very few even of the sincerest believers in the inspiration of the Bible now accept them as a matter of fact statements. It is the science of geology and more recently the science of astronomy that have broken through this time barrier and opened beyond that little yesterday of scarcely 6,000 years, a million such yesterdays. Two main sets of facts very frequently observed were forcing themselves upon men's attention long before the 18th century. One was that in innumerable districts one saw exposed great thicknesses of stratified rocks that could only have been accumulated during long periods of time and that in many cases the strata had been bent, contorted and thrust about in a way that was inevitably suggestive of enormous forces operating through long periods of time. The other was the existence of fossils similar to but not precisely like the bones and skulls and other hard parts of existing species. It was only in the 18th century that strata and fossils began to be studied systematically. It was only in the 19th that the recognition of the real scale 
and quality of these accumulations, the record of the rocks became widespread. There was a great struggle to establish the authority of the record against the prejudices of those to whom a strictly literal interpretation of the Bible was dear. Only in the 20th century have rocks been accurately dated by measuring the extent to which their radioactive minerals have decayed since they were laid down. Two hundred years ago, the imagination of our race had a background of six thousand years. Now, that curtain has risen also, and men look back to a past of thousands of millions of years. We will now summarize very compactly what is known of the material dimensions of our world. Our Earth, it has been shown, is a spinning globe. Vast though it seems to us, it is a mere speck of matter in the great vastness of space. Space is for the most part emptiness. At great intervals in this emptiness there are flaring centers of heat and light the fixed stars. They are all moving about in space, notwithstanding that they are called fixed stars. But for a long time, men did not realize their motion. They are so vast and at such tremendous distances that their motion is not perceived. Only in the course of many thousands of years it is appreciable. Scores of centuries ago, the Egyptians made star maps and they show us the shapes of constellations have changed very considerably. Many stars have moved measurably, yet while we still use the old convenient expression fixed stars to distinguish them from the planets, these fixed stars are so far off that for all their immensity they seem to be, even when we look at them through the most powerful telescopes, mere points of light brighter or less bright. Modern astronomy distinguishes many kinds of visible stars, ordinary yellow ones, red giants, red dwarfs, white dwarfs, stars that suddenly explode and vanish, double stars, and so on. Probably, each star has a life history passing in turn through several of these stages. The radio telescope has discovered other bodies such as the pulsars, 
which emit flashes of radio waves every few seconds, or in some cases, several times a second. Pulsars can emit light flashes too. They seem to be very heavy, but very small bodies spinning very fast. Some stars are powerful sources of X-rays. Vast clouds of gas and dust. Float in the emptiness between the heavenly bodies, clouds that are themselves hardly different from emptiness. Their gas is incomparably more rarefied than the so-called vacuum of a vacuum flask. One of the yellow stars is so near that we see it as a great ball of flame. This one is the sun. Its distance from the Earth is ninety-three million miles. These are difficult figures for the imagination. The astronomer nowadays uses light to pace out the distances he measures. Light travels at one hundred and eighty-six thousand miles a second. It takes a second and third to reach us from the moon, and eight minutes from the sun. Yet the sun is quite close. Compared with the other stars. The nearest of them is four light years away, which means that the light we now see it by was emitted by the stars over four years ago. The remotest parts of the universe at present. Known to astronomers, are thousands of millions of light years away. Our own star, the sun, is a swirl of flaming gas. Ninety-eight percent of its substance is a mixture of hydrogen and helium. The remaining two percent consists of vaporized iron and other elements. Altogether, it contains. Three hundred thousand times as much material as the Earth. The surface of the Sun is twice as hot as the hottest electric furnace. Its interior is thousands of times hotter. And here, the continual conversion of hydrogen to helium provides the energy. The heat of the sun 
comes in fact from the reaction we use in our hydrogen bombs. About the sun at great distances circle not only occur not only our earth about the sun at great great distances circle not only our earth but certain other kindred bodies called the planets. These shine in the sky because they reflect the light of the sun. They are near enough to us to note their movements quite easily. Night by night their positions change with regard to the fixed stars. It is well to understand how empty of matter is space. If, as we have said, the sun were a globe nine feet across, our earth would be in proportion, be the size of a one-inch ball, and at a distance of 322 yards from the sun. This is over a sixth of a mile. It would mean three and a half minutes smart walking from the ball to the nine foot globe. The moon would be a speck the size of a small pea, 30 inches from the earth. Nearer to the sun than earth would be to other very similar specks. The planets Mercury and Venus at a distance of 124 and 222 yards respectively. Beyond the Earth would come the planets Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune and Pluto at distances from the Sun of 488, 1672, 3067, 6169 and 9666 and 13000 300 yards respectively. From the Sun to Neptune would be a two hour walk. There would also be a certain number of very much smaller specks flying about amongst these planets, more particularly a number called asteroids clinging between Mars and Jupiter and occasionally a little puff of more or less luminous vapor and dust would drift into the system from the almost limitless emptiness beyond. Such a puff is what we call a comet. All the rest of the space about us and around us and for the unfathomable distances beyond is cold, lifeless and void. The nearest fixed star to us on this minute scale, be it remembered the earth as a one inch ball and the moon a little pea, would be over 40 
thousand miles away. Most of the fixed stars we would still be on the scale scores and hundreds of millions of miles off. Most of the fixed stars we see would still be on this scale scores and hundreds of millions of miles off. Let us now come back to Earth. The diameter of our world is a little under a thousand miles. Its surface is rough. The more projecting parts of the roughness are mountains and at the hollows of its surface there is a film of water, the oceans and seas. This film of water is about five miles thick at its deepest part. That is to say, the deepest oceans have a depth of five miles. This is very little in comparison with the bulk of the world. About this sphere is a thin covering of air, the atmosphere. As we ascend in a balloon or go up a mountain, the air is continually less dense until it becomes too thin to support life. At a height of 20 miles, there is scarcely any air at all. The highest point to which a bird can fly is about 4 miles up. The condor, it is said, can struggle up to that. But most small birds and insects which are carried up by airplanes or balloons drop off insensible at much lower level. Balloons with men in them have reached very nearly seven miles, but at the cost of considerable physical suffering. Airplanes with pressurized cabins, which reproduce the conditions at the Earth's surface, have flown even higher, and rockets have carried men to the moon and beyond, but only by carrying an artificial sample of the Earth's atmosphere as well. It is only in the upper few hundred feet of the crust of our Earth, in the sea and in the lower levels of the air below four miles, that life naturally occurs. We do not know of any life except in these really very shallow films of air and water upon our planet. Scientific men have discussed the possibility of life on other planets. Most planets can be ruled out for one reason or another, but it is just possible that life of a very simple kind will be found on Mars.
so much for the earth in space. Let us now consider our subject from the point of view of time. Astronomers and geologists and those who study physics are now able to tell us something of the origin of the earth. Vast ages ago, according to the current theory, one of the thin clouds of gas and dust that float between the stars began to pull itself together under the influence of gravity. It became denser and denser and the gathering material arranged itself. The details here are still controversial into a central star. The sun and a retinue of planets with their moons. It became denser and denser and the gathering material arranged itself into a central star of the sun and a retinue of planets with their moons. The concentrating material grew hotter and hotter by the gravitational energy and by radioactivity Presently, the great central sun was hot enough to ignite the hydrogen-helium reaction which now supplies its fire. Whether the Earth and our Moon arose as separate concentrations which later came to circle around each other, or whether a larger spinning mass, the original Earth, shot off part of itself to form the moon? These are questions at the time of writing have still to be decided. Scientists generally believed only a few decades ago that the sun and planets were readily, steadily cooling. According to this view, they began as spinning, flaring masses of matter. They have already lost much of their heat and are spinning much more slowly. And the system will continue to run down. There will presently come a time when the day will be as long as the year is now and the cooling sun shorn of its beams will hang motionless in the heavens. Life on earth will be frozen out Recent advances in the knowledge have completely changed the forecast. The earth is certainly cooler than it was, but radioactive changes in its interior will keep it hot for a very long time to come. The sun has hydrogen enough to burn at the present rate for thousands of millions of years. The end of terrestrial life, when it comes, will be the opposite of what was at one time foreseen. The sun, switching over to a new kind of atomic transformation, will grow larger and hotter until it engulfs all of the nearer planets, including the Earth, our planet will burn, not freeze. 
all the stages in this history can be seen in the skies. Gas clouds are condensing to form stars. Many stars are steadily burning, while others are flaring up and swelling as the sun will do. An astronomer can piece together the life history of the solar system from what he sees in the skies, just as an observer from another world, given a little theoretical knowledge, could piece together our human life history by comparing the young, the middle-aged, and the old in a crowded city street. How long, some readers will ask, has the world endured? This is a question which has attracted much attention in the last few years. Gradually, the earlier estimates, which varied very widely, have been brought towards agreement. The Earth became a solid mass some four or five thousand million years ago. It was then very hot and cooled very slowly. Not for about a thousand million years could liquid water exist on its surface. And not until that was possible could even the simplest form of life appear. As for the future, it will be several thousand million years before the expanding sun destroys all life on our planet. Since man has existed as a self-conscious social creature only a few tens of thousands of years, this gives him a limitable opportunity for the attainment of knowledge and power. Long before the earth burns up, he may make himself master of time and space. For if indeed the heavens contain if indeed the heavens contain myriads of stars in all stages of evolution, is it not likely that many of them have planets like those of our own star, the sun, and many of these planets are habitable? And if, as many people believe, Life appeared in our world in response to certain physical and chemical conditions. Will not they be inhabited too? Very interesting and suggestive discoveries have recently been made about these interstellar clouds the condensed to form the stars and their satellites. The dust includes silicates, iron, and other metals, and probably graphite materials for an earth. The gas includes a variety of simple molecules. Water, ammonia, formaldehyde, and a combination of one hydrogen with one oxygen atom called hydroxyl have all been identified. 
Methane is probably there too, though it would be difficult to detect with the methods available today. Experiments have shown that some of the complex constituents of living matter can be built from such molecules as these by electric discharges under the right condition. Experiment has shown that some of the complex constituents of living matter can be built from such molecules as these by electric discharges under the right conditions. Many scientists believe, in all seriousness, that life very similar to terrestrial life must have evolved on many millions of other planets scattered at enormous intervals through the universe. On some of them, life may be just beginning. On others, it may be far ahead of what our world has yet achieved. But as far as we are concerned today, such other living worlds, removed from ourselves by distances to be measured in light years, are utterly unattainable. Their existence is no more than a theoretical possibility. of chapter 1 of book 1 of the outline of history by H. G. Wells. This is a reading recording for Vox Olympia audiobooks. We thank our listeners for tuning in today on 24th of August 2022. Thanks and bye-bye. Hello and welcome to Vox Olympia book recordings. Our reading recordings are made possible by the generous endowment of the B.L. Himavati Literary Arts Foundation and our recording studios herein. Our reading recordings are made for the benefit of the blind, the reading disabled children, and everyone else interested in our selection of books. Our reading recordings are made accessible at Vox Olympia Audiobook Podcasts, available on Anchor.fm, Google, Spotify, and Apple Apps. On this day, the 24th of August, 2022 AD, we continue with our reading of the book, The Outline of History by H.G. Wells. Thanks for tuning in. The Outline of History by H. G. Wells Volume Volume 1 Book 1 The World Before Man Chapter 2 The Record of the Rocks The First Living Things the drifting continents, natural selection, and the change of species. 1.
we do not certainly know how life began upon the earth. Biologists have made many guesses and suggestions, and there seems to be a general agreement that life began in warm, sunlit, shallow water, possibly in pools and lagoons along the coast of the first formed seas. It began perhaps as a slime, as a sort of sub-life that slowly and imperceptibly took on the distinctive qualities of life. Upon no part of Earth at present are there the sort of conditions, chemical and physical, under which life can conceivably have begun. There is certainly no fresh beginning of life going on now. But out of inorganic matter, it is possible to make slimes and films that faintly parody the structure and even the spreading and growth of living things. If the beginning of life was a natural, unmiraculous process, then surely, someday, it will be possible for the man of science to imitate and repeat it. Until that can be done, this question necessarily remains to a certain extent speculative. And if many biologists are convinced that life appeared under the requisite conditions as naturally and inevitably as ice appears when water under the normal pressure is cooled below the freezing point, it is also the case that many other people of equal intelligence are of the opposite opinion. Here, we cannot be expected to adjudicate upon the question. The idea that life appeared on the earth as a natural and necessary chemical and physical process without the intervention of any miraculous factor seems to be very repugnant to many religious minds. But that repugnance is due perhaps rather to a confusion of thought in these minds than to any essential irreligiosity in the conception itself. They think of life as being in a way already soul. They ascribe all sorts of moral qualities to it. They side with it against dead matter. But it is difficult to see why a slug or a toadstool, a louse or a cancerous parasitic growth upon the bark of a tree should be treated as though it 
and the process of its existence or in some mysterious way higher than, for example, the beautifully marshaled elements in a crystalline group, or in a gem, or in a slab of patterned marble, or of the lovely patternings of rippled water in the sunlight, or the undulations of wind-blown sand. Why should the maker of the universe take sides between the almost inanimate and the altogether inanimate? The atmosphere was much denser in the days of life's beginning. Usually, great cloud masses obscured the sun. Frequent storms darkened the heavens. The land of those days, upheaved by violent volcanic forces, was a barren land without vegetation, without soil, almost incessant rainstorms swept down upon it, and rivers and torrents carried great loads of sediment out to sea to become muds that hardened later into slates and shales and sands that became sandstones. The geologists have studied the whole accumulation of these sediments as it remains today from those of the earliest ages to the most recent. Of course, the oldest deposits are the most distorted and changed and worn and in them there is now no certain trace to be found of life at all. Probably the earliest forms of life were small and soft, leaving no evidence of their existence behind them. It was only when some of these living things developed skeletons and shells of lime and such like hard material that they left fossil vestiges after they died and so put themselves on record for examination. The literature of geology is very largely an account of the fossils that are found in the rocks and of the order in which the layers after layers of rocks lie one on another. The very oldest rocks must have been formed before there was any sea at all, when the earth was too hot for a sea to exist and when the water that is now sea was an atmosphere of steam mixed with the air. The higher levels of the atmosphere were dense with clouds from which a hot rain fell towards the rocks below to be converted again into steam long before it reached the incandescence. 
Below the steam atmosphere, the molten world stuff solidified as the first rocks. These first rocks must have solidified as a cake over glowing liquid material beneath, much as cooling lava does. They must have appeared first as crusts and clinkers. They must have constantly remelted and recrystallized before any thickness of them became permanently solidified. The scenery of the world in those days must have been more like the interior of an electric furnace than anything else to be found upon earth at the present time. After long ages, the steam and the atmosphere began also to condense and fall right down to earth, pouring at last over these warm primordial rocks in rivulets of hot water and gathering in depressions as pools and lakes and the first seas. Into those seas, the streams that poured over the rocks brought with them dust and particles to form a sediment. And this sediment accumulated in layers or as geologists call them strata and form the first sedimentary rocks. Those earliest sedimentary rocks sank into depression and were covered by others. They were bent, tilted up and torn by great volcanic disturbances and by tidal strains that swept through the rocky crust of the earth. We find these first sedimentary rocks still coming to the surface of the land here and there, either not covered by later strata or exposed after vast ages of concealment by, by the wearing off of the rock that covered them later. There are great surfaces of them in Canada, especially. They are cleft and bent, particularly partially remelted, crystallized, hardened, compressed, but recognizable for what they are. They are cleft and bent, partially remelted, recrystallized, hardened and compressed, but recognizable for what they are. Some of them are more than 3,000 million years old. They 
are frequently called azoic or lifeless rocks. But since in some of these earliest sedimentary rocks, a substance called graphite, black lead occurs, and also red and black oxide of iron, and since it is asserted that these substances need the activity of living things for their production, which may or may not be the case, some geologists prefer to call these earliest sedimentary rock rocks archaeozoic or primordial life. But since in some of these earliest sedimentary rocks a substance called graphite or black lead occurs and also red and black oxide of iron and since it is asserted that these substances need the activity of living things for their production which may or may not be the case some geologists prefer to call these earlier sedimentary rocks Archaeozoic or primordial life. They suppose that the first life was soft living matter that had no shells or skeletons or any such structure that could remain as a recognizable fossil after its death. and that its chemical influence caused the deposition of graphite and iron oxide. Traces apparently of bacteria or of very simple plants have been found in African limestones nearly as old as the oldest known sedimentary rocks. Overlying or overlapping these azoic or archaeozoic rocks come others, manifestly also very ancient and worn, but clearly showing traces of life. These first remains are of the simplest description. They are the vestiges of simple plants called algae or marks like the tracks made by worms in sea mud. There are also the skeletons of the microscopic creatures called radiolaria. The second series of rocks is called Proterozoic beginning of life series and marks a long age in world's history. Lying over and above the Proterozoic rocks is a third series which is to be found which is found to contain a considerable number and variety of traces of living things. First 
comes the evidence of a diversity of shellfish, crabs and such like crawling things, worms, seaweeds and the like. Then of a multitude of fishes and of the beginnings of land plants and land creatures. These rocks are called Paleozoic, ancient life rocks. They mark a vast era during which life was slowly spreading, increasing and developing in the seas of our world. through long ages, through the earliest Paleozoic time. It was no more than a proliferation of such swimming and creeping things in the water. These creatures were called trilobites. They, these were crawling things like big seawood lice and they were probably related to the American king crab of today. There were also sea scorpions, the prefects of that early world. The individuals of certain species of these were nine feet long. These were the highest sort of sorts of life. These there were abundant different sorts of an order of shellfish called brachiopods. There were plant animals rooted and joined together like plants and loose weeds that waved in the waters. It was not a display of life to excite our imaginations. There was nothing that ran or flew or even swam swiftly or skillfully. Except for the size of some of the creatures, it was not very different from and rather less various than the kind of life a student would gather from any summertime ditch nowadays for microscopical examination. Such was the life of the shallow seas through a couple of hundred million years in the early Paleozoic period. The land during the time was apparently absolutely barren. We find no trace nor hint of land life. Everything that lived in those days lived under water for most or all of its life. For ages that stagger the imagination that was all there was of life, and before that time, the earth had spun hot and lifeless for hundreds of millions of years. The 
between the formation of these lower Paleozoic rocks in which the sea scorpion and trilobite ruled and our own time. There have intervened almost immeasurable ages represented by layers and masses of sedimentary rocks. There are first the upper Paleozoic rocks and above these the geologists distinguish two great divisions. Next above the Paleozoic come the Mesozoic middle life rocks. A second vast system of fossil bearing rocks representing perhaps a hundred and fifty million of swift years and containing a wonderful array of fossil remains, bones of giant reptiles and the like, which we will presently describe. And above these, again, are the Cenozoic, recent life rocks, a mere 70 million years in length, but a third great volume in the history of life an unfinished volume of which the sand and mud that were carried out to sea yesterday by the rivers of the world to bury the bones and scales of, and bodies and tracks that will become at last fossils of the things of today constitute the last written leaf. The markings and fossils in the rocks and the rocks themselves are the first historical documents. The history of life that men have puzzled out and are still puzzling out from them is called the record of the rocks. But when we call these rocks the fossils a record and a history. It must not be supposed that there is any sign of an orderly keeping of a record. Only quite recently have we learned to date the rocks exactly by the radioactive changes they have undergone since they were formed. Seldom are the rocks of the world in orderly layers one about the other convenient for men to read. They are not like the books and pages of a library. They are torn, disrupted, interrupted, flung about, defaced, like a carelessly arranged office, after it has experienced a succession of bombardment a hostile military occupation, looting, an earthquake, riots and a fire. And so, it is that for countless generations, this record of the rocks lay unsuspected beneath the feet of men. Fossils were known to the Ionian Greeks in the 6th century BC, they are discussed at Alexandria by Eratosthenes and others in the 3rd century BC, a discussion which is summarized in Strabo's geography of 20 to 10 BC, possibly. They were known to the Latin poet Ovid, but he did not understand their nature. He thought they were the first rude efforts of creative power. They were noted by Arabic writers in the 10th century. 
Leonardo da Vinci, who lived so recently as the opening of the 16th century, 1452 to 1519, was one of the first Europeans to grasp the real significance of fossils. And as we have said, it has been only within the last century and a half that man has begun the serious and sustained deciphering of these long neglected early pages of his world's history. In very recent years, another dramatic story has been traced in the rocks. The story of the wandering of the continents above the surface of the earth. We must note very briefly how this movement can happen. Underneath the seas and the land masses that rise about them, the earth is sheathed by a thick mantle of heavy crystalline rock. Two thirds of this mantle is covered by the oceans, the great land masses are made of lighter rocks and they float on the mantle as an iceberg floats on the sea with only a small part above the surface. The word float in the last sentence is legitimate because the substance of the mantle though crystalline, does in fact flow very slowly under the colossal stresses to which it is subjected, just as the ice of a glacier, though solid, flows steadily downhill. The mantle contains radioactive minerals that liberate heat all the time. Because of this internal heating, the mantle turns over in a pattern of gigantic vertical eddies, much as the water in a warmed saucepan turns over Though the rock, of course, moves very slowly, in fact, at the rate of an inch or two every year. As the mantle turns over, the floating continents are swept around on its surface. As bubbles and lights come, are swept around on the water in the saucepan. The past movements of the continents can be traced in several different ways. One of the most useful is the newly developed study of rock magnetism. Many deposits contain magnetic particles that tend to settle in a north-south direction as deposits form and before they harden into rocks. So the slight built-in magnetism of a rock can tell us how it was originally oriented. From this and other kinds of evidence, we can work out how the continents have drifted 
and still drift over the face of the earth. Two hundred million years ago, according to this evidence, the continents were grouped together much as in a lower map on page 11. Authorities are still undecided about many of the finer details of this arrangement though the broad plan seems now to be securely established. The mantle rocks, creeping very slowly for many millions of years, had swept the continental scum together into a single mass. But at about this time, the supercontinent on which the great reptiles were already beginning to crawl was torn apart by a new eddy pattern developing deep in the Earth's crust. Hot rocks began to well up under a wavy north-south line down the middle of the mass, where presently the North and South Atlantic Oceans were to grow. The rising stream of rock spread east and west, pulling the floating continents apart and sweeping the Americas further and further from Europe and Africa. This movement still continues. A flat ridge, a mile or two high, but over a hundred miles wide, runs down the middle of the North and South Atlantic. Here, the heated mantle rocks well up and spread sideways. Along the Pacific coast of the Americas is a strip where the mantle descends again. Deep trenches on the ocean side of the strip show where the rock is sucked down. On the landward side, great mountain ranges, the Rockies and the Andes have piled up because the continental scum arriving from the east is too light to be drawn down into the depth of the mantle. In such regions as this, there may be frequent volcanic eruptions as the rocks, locally melted by friction, are squeezed out onto the surface and of course violent earthquakes. Meanwhile, other mantle currents have torn and moved the continental masses. A comparison of the two maps on page 11 will show the more important displacement. Particularly impressive is the journey of India, swept some 4,000 miles northwards at an average speed of nearly 2 inches a year to join the rest of the Asian continent. The slow impact of its arrival, assisted by an anti-clockwise rotation of Africa threw up the Alps, the Atlas Mountains, the Caucasus and the Himalayas. Australia, torn away from Antarctica, moved eastwards and northwards 
Antarctica wandered south carrying the peat, coal and fossil reptiles that testify today to its warmer past. Nowadays, the newer upcurrents are widening the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf by about half an inch a year and the rift valleys of Africa seem to be the first signs of a system of deep currents that will presently break up the continent. Every species of living things is continually dying and being born anew as a multitude of fresh individuals. This is as true of all the minute creatures that swarmed and reproduced and died in the Archaeozoic and Proterozoic seas as it is of men today. This growth and dying and reproduction of living things lead to some very wonderful consequences. The young that a living thing produces are never exactly like it or like each other. There is always a slight difference which we speak of as individuality. Consider then what must happen to a newborn generation of living things of any species. Some of the individuals will be stronger or sturdier or better suited to succeed in life in some ways than the rest. Many individuals will be weaker or less suited. In particular single cases, any sort of luck or accident may occur, but on the whole, the better equipped individuals will live and grow up and reproduce themselves and the weaker will as a rule go under. The latter will be less able to get food, to fight their enemies and pull through. So that in each generation there is, as it were, a picking over of a species, a picking out of the most of the weak or unsuitable and a preference for the strong and suitable. This process is called natural selection of the survival of the fittest. Though survival of the fitter would be the more precise expression. It follows therefore from the fact that living things grow and breed and die that every species so long as the conditions under which it lives remain the same becomes more and more perfectly fitted to those conditions in every generation. But conditions do not remain the same and every species lives a little uneasily in its condition. Adaptation is always imperfect and sometimes it is very imperfect. 
and coming to the help of life and fitting itself to the exigencies of circumstance is the fact that ever and again appear novelties in structure, sudden marked differences called mutations. Differences much greater than the ordinary individual difference. These mutations may be encumbrances in the struggle for life or helps or they may not affect an animal's chance at all. In the former case, they are rejected by natural selection. In the second, they are welcomed and encouraged. In the third, they may spread throughout a species unchallenged, features neither helpful nor harmful, a spontaneous change. We do not as yet know what causes mutations. We know only that life is continually experimenting in this way and that its experiments come to the sieve of natural selection for endorsement, indifference or elimination. Mutation itself seems to be an entirely haphazard process. A mutation may just hit the urgent need of the time, maybe a pointless irrelevance, or it may be an absurd variation. In the latter case, it produces a monster which dies. In the former, it spreads throughout the species. Let us, to take a simple instance, here consider the case of some little furry whitey brown animals, witty brown animals living in a bitterly cold land which is usually under snow. Such individuals as have the thickest, whitest fur, will be least hurt by cold, less seen by their enemies, and less conspicuous as they seek their prey. Every mutation in that direction will be advantageous. The fur of this species will thicken, and its whiteness increase with every generation until there is no advantage in carrying on an, any more fur. Imagine now a change of climate that brings warmth into the land, sweeps away the snows, makes white creatures glaringly visible during the greater part of the year, and thick fur and encumbrance. Then, every individual with a touch of brown in its coloring and thin of fur will find itself at an advantage, and very white and heavy fur will be a handicap. Every favorable mutation will be seized upon and welcomed by natural selection during the age of stress. There will be a weeding out of the white in favor of the brown in each generation. If this change of climate comes about too quickly and no favorable mutations chance along, the species may be exterminated. But if mutations appear, of a helpful kind and have time to spread themselves widely, the species, although it may have a hard time, may yet be able to change itself 
and adapt itself generation by generation. This change and adaptation is called the modification of species. Perhaps this change of climate does not occur all over the lands inhabited by the species. Maybe it occurs only on one side of some great arm of the sea or some great mountain range or such like divide and not on the other. A warm ocean current like the Gulf Stream may be deflected and flow so as to warm one side of the barrier leaving the other still cold. Then on the cold side this species will still be going on to its utmost possible furriness and whiteness and on the other side it will be modifying to its brownness and a thinner coat. At the same time I will probably be other changes going on. A difference in the pause perhaps may be encouraged here and discouraged there because one half of the species will be frequently scratching through snow for its food while the other will be scampering over brown earth. Probably also the difference of climate will mean difference in the sort of food available and that may favor differences in teeth and the digestive organs and there may be changes in the sweat and oil glands of the skin due to the changes in the fur and these will affect the excretory organs and all the internal chemistry of the body and so through all the structure of the creature a time may come when two separated varieties of this formerly single species may become so unlike each other through the accumulation of individual and mutational differences as to be recognizably different species. Such a splitting up of species in the course of generations into two or more species is called the differentiation of species. And it should be clear to the reader, given these elemental facts of life, given growth and depth and reproduction, with individual variation and mutation in a world that changes, life must change in this way. Modification and differentiation must occur. Old species must disappear and new ones appear. We have chosen for our instance here a familiar sort of animal. But what is true of furry beasts in snow and ice is true of all life and equally true of soft jellies and simple beginnings that flowed and crawled for hundreds of millions of years between the tidal levels and in the shallow warm waters of the Proterozoic seas. They were all varying and mutating and living in a world of change that encouraged many of their variations and mutations. Natural selection is a slower process with man than with any other creature. It takes 20 years or more before an ordinary Western European grows up and reproduces. In the case of most animals, the new generation is on trial in a year or less. With such simple and lowly beings, however, as first appeared in the primordial seas, growth and reproduction was probably a matter of a few brief hours or even of a few brief minutes. 
modification and differentiation of species must accordingly have been extremely rapid and life had already developed a greater variety of widely contrasted forms before it began to leave traces in the rocks. The record of the rocks does not begin therefore with any group of closely related forms from which all subsequent and existing creatures are descended, it begins in the sea. Nearly every main division of the animal kingdom already represented. Plants are already plants, and animals, animals. The brachiopods are already in their shells, consuming much of the same sort of food that oysters and mussels do now. The great water scorpions crawl among the seaweeds. The trilobites roll up into balls and unroll and scuttle away. In that ancient mud, there was probably as rich a life of infusoria and the likes as one finds in a drop of ditch water today. In the ocean, there was an abundance of minute and translucent, often phosphorescent beings. But the land above the high tide line was still, so far as we can guess, a stony wilderness without a trace of life. End of chapter 2 of book 1 of volume 1 of the outline of history by H. G. Wells. This has been a recording for Vox Olympia audiobooks. We thank our listeners for tuning in today on August 24th, 2022. Bye-bye. Hello and welcome to Vox Olympia book readings. Our reading recordings are made for the benefit of the blind, the reading disabled, children and everyone else interested in our books. Our recordings are presently conducted at the B.L. Himawati Literary Arts Foundation on this day, the 30th of August, 2022. We continue with our reading from the Outline of History by H.G. Wells. Thanks to your listeners for tuning in. The Outline of History by H. G. Wells Book 1 The World Before Man Chapter 3 Life and Climate One. Life and water, water plants. 2. The earliest land animals. 3. Why life must change continually. 1. Wherever the shoreline ran, there was life, and that life went on in and by and with water as its home, its medium, and its fundamental necessity. The first 
jelly-like beginnings of life must have perished whenever they got out of the water as jellyfish dry up and perish on our beaches today. Drying up was the fatal thing for life in those days against which at first it had no protection. But in a world of rain pools and shallow seas and tides, any variation that enabled a living thing to hold out and keep its moisture during hours of low tide or drought met with every encouragement in the circumstances of the time. There must have been a constant risk of stranding and on the other hand life had to keep rather near the shore and beaches in the shallows because it had need of air dissolved of course in the water and light. No creature can breathe, no creature can digest its food without water. We talk of breathing air, but what all the living things really do is to breathe oxygen dissolved in water. The air we ourselves breathe must first be dissolved in the moisture in our lungs. All our food must be liquefied before it can be assimilated. Water living creatures, which are always under water, wave the freely exposed gills by which they breathe in that water and extract the air dissolved in it. But a creature that is exposed for any time out of the water must have its body and its breathing apparatus protected from drying up before the seaweeds could creep out out of the early Paleozoic seas into the intertidal line of the beach they had to develop a tougher outer skin to hold their moisture. Before the ancestor of the sea scorpion could survive being left by the tide, it had to develop its casting and armor. The trilobites probably developed their tough covering and rolled up into balls far less as a protection against each other and any other enemies they may have possessed than as a precaution against drying. And when presently, as we ascend the Paleozoic rocks, the fish appear, first of all the backbone, first of all the backbone or vertebrated animals, it is evident that a number of them are already adapted by the protection of their gills with gill covers and by a sort of primitive lung swimming bladder to face the same risk of temporary stranding. Now, the weeds and the plants that were adapting themselves to intertidal conditions were also bringing themselves into a region of brighter light. And light is very necessary and precious to all plants. Any development of structure that would stiffen them and hold them up to the light 
so that instead of crumpling and flopping when the waters receded, they would stand up, outspread. And this was a great advantage. And so we find them developing fiber and support and the beginning of woody fiber in them. The early plants reproduce by soft spores or half animal gametes that were released in the water were distributed by water and could only germinate under water. The early plants were tied and most lowly plants today are tied by the conditions of their life cycle to water. But here again there was a great advantage to be got by the development of some protection of the spores from drought that would enable reproduction to occur without submergence. So, soon as a species could do that, it could live and reproduce and spread above the high water mark bathed in light and out of the reach of the beating and distress of the waves. The main classificatory divisions of the larger plants mark the stages in the release of plant life from the necessity of submergence by the development of woody support and of a method of reproduction that is more and more defiant of drying up. The lower plants are still prisoner attendants of water. The lower mosses must live in damp and even the development of the spore of the ferns demand at certain stages extreme wetness. The highest plants have carried freedom from water so far that they can live and reproduce if only there is some moisture in the soil below them. They have solved the problem of living out of water altogether. The essentials of that problem were worked out through the vast aeons of the Pro Proterozoic Age and the early Paleozoic Age by nature's method of experiment and trial. Then slowly, but in great abundance, a variety of new plants began to swarm away from the sea and over the lower lands, still keeping to swamp and lagoon and watercourse as they spread. There was not, perhaps, the same distinction between sea plants and freshwater plants that there is today. The sea was probably less salty than it is now. And after the plants came the animal life. There is no sort of land animal in the world as there is no sort of land plant whose structure is not primarily that of a water inhabiting being which has been adapted through the modification and differentiation of species to life out of the water. 
This adaptation is attained in various ways. In the case of the land scorpion, the gill plates of the primitive sea scorpion are sunk in into the body so as to make the lung books secure from rapid evaporation. The gills of crustaceans, such as crabs, which run about in the air, are protected by the gill cover extensions of the back shell or carapace. The ancestors of the insects developed a system of air pouches and air tubes, the tracheal tubes, which carry the air all over the body before it is dissolved. In the case of the vertebrated land animals, the gills of the ancestral fish were first supplemented and then replaced by a bag-like growth from the throat, the primitive lung-swimming bladder. To this day, there survive certain mudfish which enable us to understand very clearly the method by which the vertebrated land animals work their way out of the water. These creatures, the African lungfish for example, are found in tropical regions in which there is a rainy full season and a dry season during which the rivers become mere ditches of baked mud. During the rainy season, these fish swim about and breathe by gills like any other fish. As the waters of the river evaporate, they bury themselves in the mud, their gills go out of action, and the creature keeps itself alive until the water returns by swallowing air, which passes into its swimming bladder. The Australian lungfish, when it is caught by drying up of the river in stagnant pools and the water has become deaerated and foul, rises to the surface and gulps air. A newt in a pond does exactly the same thing. These creatures still remain at the transition stage, the stage at which the ancestors of the higher vertebrated animals were released from their restriction to an underwater life. The amphibia, frogs, newts, tritons, etc., still show in their life history all the stages in the process of this liberation. They are still dependent on water for their reproduction. Their eggs must be laid in sunlit water and there they must develop. The young tadpole has branching external gills that wave in the water. There is a gill cover. Then a gill cover grows back over them and forms a gill chamber. Then as the creature's legs appear and its tail is absorbed, it begins to use its lungs and its gills dwindle and vanish. The tadpole can live underwater continually. The adult frog can live all the rest of its days in the air, but it can be drowned if it is kept steadfastly below water.
and we ascend the scale of existence to the level of the reptile however, we find an egg which is protected from evaporation by a tough egg case and this egg produces young which breathe by lungs from the very moment of hatching. The reptile is on all fours with the seeding plant in its freedom from necessity to pass any stage of its life cycle in water. But it can be drowned if it is kept under water without intermission. The later Paleozoic rocks of the Northern Hemisphere give us the materials for a series of pictures of the slow spreading of life over the land. Geographically, it was an age of lagoons and shallow seas very favorable to this invasion. It is possible that, as yet, there were no seas as deep as the present oceans. The new plants now, that they had acquired the power to live the new aerial life, developed with an extraordinary richness and variety. There were as yet no true flowering plants, no grasses, nor trees that shed their leaves in winter. The first flora consisted of great tree ferns, gigantic equisetums, cicad ferns, and kindred vegetation. Many of these plants took the form of huge stem trees, of which great multitudes of trunk survive fossilized to this day. Some of these trees were over a hundred feet high. They belong to orders and classes now vanished from the world. They stood with their stems in the water in which no doubt there was a thick tangle of soft mosses and green slimes, slime and fungoid growths that left few plain vestiges behind them. The abundant pulped up remains of these first swamp forests constitute the main coal measures of the world today. Amidst this luxuriant primitive vegetation, crawled and glided and flew the first insects. They were rigid winged, four winged creatures, often very big, some of them having wings measuring a foot in length. There was numerous dragonflies, one found in, in the Belgian coal measure that had a wingspan of 29 inches. There were also a great variety of flying cockroaches, scorpions abounded, and a number of early spiders. The spinnerets of these spiders were absent or simple, so that they made no webs or very simple ones. Land snails appeared. So did the first known step of our own ancestry upon the land, the amphibia. As we ascend the higher levels of the later Paleozoic record, we find the process of air adaptation has gone as far as the appearance of true reptiles amidst the abundant and various amphibia. The land life of the Upper Paleozoic Age was the life of an evergreen swamp forest 
without flowers or birds or the noises or modern insects. If a man could be transported back to those verdurous lagoons, he would probably be terrified at the stillness. He would hear little but the ripple of water, the sound of wind in the leaves, or the crash of some falling tree. Everything would seem waiting and expectant. The trees and plants would look more like magnified mosses than any trees or plants he knew. There were no big land beasts at all. Wallowing amphibia and primitive reptiles were the very highest creatures that life had so far produced. None of them had yet attained to very great dimensions. Whatever land lay away from the water or high above the water was still altogether barren and lifeless. But steadfastly, generation by generation, life was creeping away from the shallow sea water of its beginnings. Three. The record of the rocks is like a great book that has been carelessly misused. All its pages are torn, worn and defaced and many are altogether missing. The outline of the story that we sketch The outline of the story that we sketch here has been pierced together slowly, has been pieced together slowly and painfully in an investigation that is still incomplete and still in progress. The Carboniferous rocks, the coal measures, give us a vision of the first great expansion of life over the wet lowlands. Then come the torn pages of the Permian rocks, which count as the last of the Paleozoic, that preserve little of the land vestiges of their age. Only after a long interval of time does the history spread out generously again. The Permian rocks record an age of harshness and desolation in the world's history. They mark the phase of transition from the Paleozoic Age of Fish and Amphibia to the Mesozoic Age of Reptiles. It must be borne in mind that the great changes of climate have always been in progress, sometimes stimulating and sometimes checking life. Every species of living thing is always adapting itself more and more closely to its condition which are always changing. There is no finality in adaptation. There is a continuing urgency to its change. We do, however, find certain creatures of a lowly type which early adapted themselves to widespread simple conditions so completely that they have never been greatly modified or exterminated or replaced. For example, there is a little shellfish called Lingula, fitted to an obscure 
sedentary life in the warm seas. This genus has endured without conspicuous change throughout the entire geological record. On the other hand, geologists show us collections of fossils in which one can trace modifications in only a few thousand years as climate, food and enemies have changed. The slow drifting of the continents must have greatly affected the conditions to which their inhabitants were exposed. Not only were continents carried from warm latitudes to cold and from cold to warm, Their gradual separation from each other in the Mesozoic period must in itself have been an important climatic consequence. The interior of that great supercontinent, remote from the tempering influence of the seas, must have presented a forbidding environment to those plants and animals that were pressing to complete the conquest of the land, a super desert with scalding days and icy nights. Apart from this, the climate of the world as a whole has varied from age to age, not with a regular rhythm, but fluctuating irregularly between heat and cold. The cause of these fluctuations are still not understood. They may be tied up with other still mysterious events, for example, the regular variations in the Earth's magnetic field and in the speed with which the Earth spins. There has been a gradual sl slowing of the Earth's rotation over the ages, due to the friction of the tides. The day lengthens on the average by about two seconds every hundred thousand years. But the rate of slowing is not in fact quite uniform. The day may even shorten very slightly year by year for a few decades before the overall slowing is resumed. Even from the Zoic or the Archaeozoic ages, there are traces in ice-worn rocks and the like of periods of extreme cold. There have been other ice ages since then. There have been periods of great wetness and great dryness on the earth. And in accordance we find from the record in the rocks that there have been long periods of expansion and multiplication when life flowed and abounded and buried in harsh ages when there was a great weeding out and disappearance of species, genera and classes and the learning of stern lessons by all that survived. It is probable that the warm spells have been long relatively to the cold ages, and our world today seems to be emerging with fluctuations from a prolonged phase of adversity and extreme conditions. Half a million years ahead, it may be a winterless world with trees and vegetation even in the polar circles. If so, there will be less room for us. The vast ice caps of the ice ages lower the sea level by more than 300 feet, exposing great areas of land now submerged. If our present day ice caps were to melt, sea level would rise by a hundred feet and much low-lying land including London, New York and all ports and lowland cities would be drowned. But perhaps we're merely at an interglacial period and soon the ice will advance again, 
are present. We have no certainty in such a forecast, but as knowledge increases, it may be possible that our race will make its plans thousands of years ahead to meet the coming changes. End of chapter 3, Life and Climate of Book 1, The World Before Man from Volume 1 of The Outline of History by H. G. Wells. The Outline of History by H. G. Wells Volume 1 Book 1 Chapter 4 The Age of Reptiles Age of Lowland Life 2. Dragons 3. The First Birds 4. An Age of Hardship and Death 5. The First Appearance of Fur and Feathers 1. We know that for many millions of years, the wetness and warmth, the shallow lagoon conditions that made possible the vast accumulations of veg vegetable matter, which, compressed and mummified, are now coal, prevailed over much of the world. There were some cold intervals, it is true. But they did not last long enough to destroy the growths. Then, that long age of luxuriant low-grade vegetation drew to its end. And for a time, life on Earth seems to have undergone a period of worldwide bleakness. This concludes what we may call Part 1 and by far the longest part in the history of life on this planet. When the story resumes again, after this arrest at the end of the Paleozoic era, we find life entering upon a fresh phase of richness and expansion. Vegetation has made great advances in the art of living out of water. While the Paleozoic plants of the cold measures probably grew with the swamp water flowing over their roots, the Mesozoic flora from its very outset included palm-like cycads and low ground conifers that were distinctly land plants growing on soil above the water level. The low levels of the Mesozoic land were no doubt covered by great fern breaks and shrubby bush and a kind of jungle growth of trees.
But there existed as yet no grass, no turf, or green sward, and no flowering plants at all, great or small. Probably the Mesozoic was not an age of very brightly colored vegetation. Must have had a flora green in the wet season, brown and purple in the dry. Probably it was not nearly so beautiful as the woods and thickets of today. There were no gay flowers, no bright autumn tints before the fall of the leaf, because there, were, there was as yet no fall of the leaf. And beyond the low levels, the world was still barren, still unclothed, still exposed without any mitigation to the wear and tear of the wind and the rain. When one speaks of the conifers and the Mesozoic, the reader must not think of the pines and the firs that clothe the high mountain slopes of our time. He must think of lowland evergreens. The mountains were still as bare and lifeless as ever. The only color effects among the mountains were the color effects of naked rocks. Such colors as make the landscape of Colorado so marvelous today. Amidst the spreading vegetation of the lower plains, the reptiles were increasingly mightily in multitude and variety. They were now, in many cases, absolutely land animals. There are numerous anatomical points of distinction between a reptile and an amphibian. They held good between such reptiles and amphibians as prevail in the Carboniferous time, the Upper Paleozoic. But the fundamental difference between reptiles and amphibians, which matters in this history, is that amphibians must go back to water to lay its eggs, and that in the early stages of its life it must live in and under water. The reptile, on the other hand, had cut out all the tadpole stages from its life cycle, and to be more exact, its tadpole stages got through before the young leave the egg case. The reptile has come out of the water altogether. Some had gone back to it again, just as the hippopotamus and the otter among mammals have gone back. But that is a further extension of the story, that is a detail and complication to which we cannot give much attention in this outline. In the Paleozoic period, as we have said, life had not spread beyond the swampy river valleys and the borders of sea lagoons and the like. But in the Mesozoic life, was growing even more accustomed to the thinner medium of the air and was sweeping boldly up over the plains towards the hillsides. It is well for the student of human history and the human future to note that if a disembodied intelligence with no knowledge of the future had come to earth and studied life during the early Paleozoic age, he might very reasonably have concluded that life was absolutely confined in, to the water and that it could never have spread over land. It found a way. In the later Paleozoic period, that visitant might have equally been sure that life could not go beyond the edge of the swamp, the Mesozoic period would still have found him setting bounds to life 
far more limited than the bounds that are set today. And so today, though we mark how life and man are still limited to five miles of air and a depth of perhaps a mile or so of sea, we must now con not we must not conclude from that present limitation that life through man may not presently spread out and up and down to a range of living as yet inconceivable. The earliest known reptiles were beasts with great bellies and not very powerful legs. Very like their kindred amphibia, wallowing as the crocodile wallows to this day. But in the Mesozoic, they soon began to stand up and go stoutly on all fours, and several great sections of them began to balance themselves on tail and hind legs, rather as the kangaroos do now, in order to release the forelimbs for grasping food. The bones of one notable division of reptiles, which retained a quadrupedal habit, a division of which many remains have been found in South African and Russian early Mesozoic de deposits, display a number of characters which approach those of mammalian skeletons. And because of this resemblance to mammals, beasts, this division is called Theriomorpha, beast-like. Another division was the crocodile branch, and another developed towards the tortoise and turtles, the plesiosaurus and ichthyosaurus were two groups which have left no living representatives. They were huge reptiles returning to a whale-like life in the sea. Pleosaurus, one of the largest plesiosaurus, measured 30 feet from snout to tail tip, of which half was neck. The Moasasaurus the Mosasaurus were a third group of great porpoise like marine lizards. The Mosasaurus were a third group of great porpoise like marine lizards. But the largest and most diversified group of these Mesozoic reptiles were, was a very group known as dinosaurs many of which attained quite enormous proportions. In bigness, these great dinosaurs have never been exceeded. Although the sea can still show in the whales creatures as great, some of these and the largest among them were herbivorous animals. They browsed on the rushy vegetation and among the ferns and bushes. Or they stood up and grasped trees with their forelegs while they devoured, devoured the fo foliage. Among the browsers, for example, was the Diplodocus carnegi. Among the browsers, for example, was the Diplodocus carnegi, which measured 84 feet in length. The Brachiosaurus was still more colossal.
It had a live weight about 50 tons. Still larger bones are appearing. These great monsters had legs and they usually figured as standing up on them. But it is very doubtful if they could have supported their weight in this way out of water. The bones end in cartilage. The joints are not very strong. Buoyed up by water or mud, these monsters could, could have got along very well. The ordinary big dinosaur has a bulky lower body and lower limbs which were probably almost always submerged or floating. Neck, head and forelimbs are as much lighter in structure and they were probably kept out of water. Another noteworthy type of dinosaur was the Triceratops, a reptilian parallel of the hippopotamus but with a rhinoceros-like horn. They were also a great number of flesh eaters who preyed upon these herbivores. Of these, the Tyrannosaurus seems almost the last word in frightfulness among living things. Some species of this genus measured 40 feet from snout to tail. Apparently, it carried its vast body kangaroo fashion on its tail and hind legs. Probably, it reared itself up. Some authorities even suppose that it kept, it leapt through the air. If so, it possessed mus muscles of a quite miraculous quality. A leaping elephant would be a far less astounding idea. Much more probably, it waded half submerged in pursuit of herbivores. Herbivores marsh saurians may have fought out its skills in channels and sheets of water like the Norfolk Broads or the Everglades of Florida. One special development of the dinosaurian type of reptile was a light hopping, climbing group of creatures which developed a bat-like web between the fourth finger and the side of the body which was used in gliding from tree to tree after the fashion of the flying squirrels. These bat-like lizards were the pterodactyls. They were often described as flying reptiles. And pictures are drawn of Mesozoic scenery in which they are seen soaring and swooping about. But their breastbone has no keel, such as a breastbone of a bird has for the attachment of muscles strong enough for vigorous flight. They must have soared as vultures soar today. 
They must have had a grotesque resemblance to heraldic dragons. And they played the part of modern birds in Mesozoic skies. But bird-like though they were, they were not birds, nor ancestors of birds. The structure of their wings was that of a hand with one long finger and a web. The wing of a bird is like an arm with feathers projecting from its hind edge. And these pterodactyls had no feathers. The feather is a specialized skin structure which was developed only once in the evolution of life. Some fossils show that pterodactyls had a simple kind of fur. Far less prevalent at this time were certain other truly bird-like creatures of which the earlier sorts also hopped and clambered and the latter and the later sorts skimmed and flew. These were at first, by all standards of classification, reptile. They developed into true birds as their reptilian scales became long and complicated fronds rather than scales. And so at last, by much spreading and splitting feathers, feathers are the distinct covering of birds. They give a power of resisting heat and cold far greater than that of any inter integumentary covering except perhaps the thickest fur. At a very early stage, this novel covering of feathers, this new heat-proof contrivance that life had chanced upon, enabled many species of birds to invade a province for which the pterodactyl was ill-equipped. They took to sea fishing, if indeed they did not begin with it, and spread to the north and south polewards beyond the temperature limits set to true reptiles. The earliest known bird the Archaeopteryx had no beak. It had a row of teeth in a jaw like a reptile's. It had three claws at the forward corner of its wings. Its tail too was peculiar. All modern birds have tail feathers set in a short compact bony rump. The Archaeopteryx had a long bony tail like a lizard's but with a row of feathers along each side. It is quite possible that most of the earliest birds did not fly at all, that they were that there were birds before flying. They may have run rather like hens spreading their arms a little to balance and steer, but once the feathers developed, so light and strong and so easy to spread, there was only a question of time before the wing began to carry the bird. By the end of the Mesozoic, there were birds of many kinds, strong flyers, soarers, runners and divers with greatly reduced wings. 
One or two of these early birds had, it seems, retained the simple teeth of their reptilian ancestors. Four. This great period of Mesozoic life, the second volume of the Book of Life, is indeed an amazing story of reptilian life proliferating and developing. But the most striking thing of all the story remains to be told. Right after the la latest Mesozoic rocks, we find all these reptilian order we have enumerated still flourishing unchallenged. There is no hint of an enemy or a competitor to them and the relics we find of their world. Then the record is broken. We do not know how long a time that the break represents. Many pages may be missing here. Pages that may represent some great cataclysmal change of terrestrial conditions. When next we find abundant traces of land plants and the land animals of the earth, this great multitude of reptile species had gone. For most part, they have left no descendants. They have been wiped out. The pterodactyls have gone absolutely. Of the plesiosaurs and the ichthyosaurs, none is alive. The mosasaurs, the mosasaurs have gone. Of the lizards, a few remain. The monitors of the Dutch East Indies, being the largest, of all the multitude and diversity of the dinosaurs, have vanished. Only the crocodiles and the turtles and tortoises carry on in any quantity into the later times. The place of all these types in the spectacle of the world that the Cenozoic fossils presently unfold to us is taken by other animals not closely related to the Mesozoic reptiles and certainly not descended from any of their ruling types. A new kind of life is in possession of the world. This apparently abrupt ending up of reptiles is beyond all question. The most striking revolution in the whole history of the earth before the coming of mankind it is probably connected with the close of a vast period of equable, warm conditions and the onset of a new austerer age in which the winters were bitterer and the summers brief but hot. The Mesozoic life, animals and vegetable alike, was adapted to warm conditions and capable of little resistance to cold. The new life, on the other hand, was before all things capable of gr resisting great changes of temperature. It was not only that reptiles as such had no feathers, had no fur nor feathers to equalize temperature conditions, but the structure of the repl reptilian heart is also not adapted to the maintenance of a high temperature against surrounding cold. Whatever it was that led to the extinction of the Mesozoic reptiles, it was probably some far-reaching change, change indeed, for the life of the seas did at the same time undergo a similar catastrophic alteration. The crescendo and, and ending of the reptiles on land was paralleled by the crescendo 
and ending of the Ammonites, a division of creatures like squids with coiled shells which swarmed in those ancient seas. Most people are familiar with their huge coiling shells, sometimes two feet or more in diameter. All through the rocky record of this Mesozoic period, there is a vast multitude and variety of these ammonites. There are hundreds of species, and towards the end of the Mesozoic period, they increased in diversity and produced exaggerated types. When the record resumes, these two have gone. They have left no remnant at all. So far as the reptiles are concerned, people may perhaps be inclined to argue that they were exterminated because the mammals that replaced them competed with them and were more fitted to survive. But nothing of that sort can be true of the Ammonites because to this day their place has not been taken. Simply, they are gone. Unknown conditions made it possible for them to live in the Mesozoic seas. And then some unknown change, some jolt in the orderly succession of days and seasons made life impossible for them. No genus of Ammonites survives today of all that vast variety. But there still exists one isolated genus, very closely related to Ammonites, the pearly Nautilus. It is found to be noted in the warm waters of the Indian and Pacific Oceans. And as for the mammals competing with and ousting the less fit reptiles, a struggle of which people, people talk at times, there is not a scrap of evidence of any such direct competition. To judge by the record of rocks as we know it today, there is much reason for believing that, the f that first the reptiles in some inexplicable way perished, and then later on, after a very hard time for all life upon the earth, the mammals, as conditions became more genial again, developed and spread to the vacant world. Nothing is known of the causes of this revolution in terrestrial conditions. A remarkable fact whose truth has only become established in the last few years is this. The Earth's magnetic field sometimes reverses itself completely so that a compass needle would turn and point in the opposite direction. The field is generated by the swelling around of molten iron in the Earth's core. It resembles the field that would surround an enormous bar magnet lying roughly along the axis on which the Earth rotates. But the magnet wobbles. The magnetic north wanders a little relative to true north. There are considerable fluctuations in magnetic strength. Every now and again, it seems, the wobbles are strong enough to overturn some kind of balance. The field disappears, then reappears the other way up. This happens at long and regular intervals. The field may be wobbling in one direction for anything from 10,000 to 10 million years, and then over it goes again. Its history can be reconstructed by measuring the direction of magnetic particles in the basalt and other rocks laid down at different dates. The last universal was a hundred and ten thousand years ago. So we may be due for the next quite soon. The last reversal was a hundred and ten thousand years ago, so we may be due for 
the next quite soon. Many biologists believe that the magnetic reversals could act as spurs to evolution. Cosmic rays are known to stimulate mutation, part of the cosmic radiation that would otherwise fall on the earth is kept out by these magnetic fields. The field disappears for a little while when it is changing over a little while on this geological time scale meaning several thousands of years. This will be a time of increased radiation exposure and perhaps of accelerated evolutions. New bacteria or viruses may, might appear and destroy whole populations of animals. However, there is as yet no sure evidence of a series of forward bounds in evolution corresponding to magnetic reversals. Five. Were there mammals in the Mesozoic period? No doubt there were, but they were small, obscure and rare, and paleontology has very little to tell about them. Patiently and steadily the geologists gather fresh evidence and reason out completer conclusions. At any time, some new deposits may reveal fossils that will illuminate this question. Certainly, other mammals or the ancestors of the mammals must have lived throughout the Mesozoic period. In the very opening chapter of the Mesozoic volume of the record, there were those thermomorph reptiles Theromorph reptiles to which we have already alluded, and in the later Mesozoic, a number of small jawed bones are found entirely mammalian in character. But there is not a scrap, not a bone, to suggest that there lived any Mesozoic mammals which could look a dinosaur in the face. Mesozoic mammals or mammal like reptiles for we do not clearly know which they were, seem to have been all the obscure little beasts of the size of mice and rats, more like a downtrodden order of reptiles than a distinct class. Probably they still laid eggs and were developing only slowly their distinctive covering of hair. They lived away from big waters, and perhaps in the desolate uplands as marmots do now. Probably they lived there beyond the pursuit of the carnivorous dinosaurs. Some perhaps went on all fours, some briefly went on their hind legs and clambered with their forelimbs. They became fossils only so occasionally that chance has not yet revealed as a single complete skeleton in the whole long record of the Mesozoic rocks by which to check their guesses. These little theromorphs, these ancestral mammals, developed hair. Hairs, like feathers, are long, elaborately specialized scales. Hair is perhaps the clue to the salvation of the early mammals. Leading lives upon the margin of existence, away from the marshes and the warmth, they developed an outer covering only second in its warmth holding or heat resisting powers to the down and feathers of the arctic seabirds leading lives upon the margin of existence away from the marshes and the warmth they developed an 
outer covering only second in its warmth holding or heat resisting powers to the down and feathers of the arctic seabirds and to the mammals and so the mammals like the birds held out through the age of hardship between mesozoic and cenozoic ages to which most of the true reptiles succumbed all the main characteristics of the flora and the sea and the land fauna that disappeared with the end of the Mesozoic age were such as were adapted to an equable climate and to a shallow and swampy regions. But in the case of their Cenozoic successors, both hair and feathers gave a power of resistance to variable temperatures such as no reptile possessed and with it they gave a range far greater than any mammal had hitherto attained. The range of life of the lower Paleozoic period was confined to warm water. The range of life of the upper Paleozoic period was mainly confined to warm water or to warm swamps and wet ground. The range of life of the Mesozoic period as we know it was largely confined to water and fairly low-lying valley regions under equable conditions. But in each of these periods, there were types involuntarily extending the range of life beyond the prevailing limits. And when ages of extreme conditions prevailed, it was these marginal types which survived to inherit the depopulated world. That, perhaps, is the most general statement we can make about the story of the geological record. It is a story of widening range. Classes, genera, and species of animals appear and disappear, but the range widens. It widens always. Life has never had so great a range as it has today. Life today, in the form of man, goes incomparably further than any species has ever gone before. Man's geographical range is from pole to pole. He goes under water down to the cold darkness of the deepest seas. He rockets himself to the moon and beyond. And in thought and knowledge, he pierces to the center of the earth and reaches out to the uttermost star. And in all the relics of the Mesozoic time, we find no certain memorials of his ancestry. His ancestors, like the ancestors of all the kindred mammals, must have been creatures so rare, so obscure, and so remote that they have left scarcely a trace amidst the abundant vestiges of the monsters that wallowed rejoicing in the steamy air and lush vegetation of the Mesozoic lagoons, or crawled, or hopped, or fluttered over the great plains of that time. His ancestors, like the ancestors of all the kindred mammals, must have been creatures so rare, so obscure, and so remote that they have left scarcely a trace amidst the abundant vestiges of the monsters that wallowed, rejoicing in the steamy air and lush vegetation of the Mesozoic lagoons, or crawled, or hopped, or fluttered over the great plains, river plains of that time. End of chapter for the age of reptiles from the book one the world before man of volume one of the book the outline of history by H.G. Wells
This has been a reading recording for Vox Olympia audiobooks available as podcasts on anchor.fm, Spotify, Google and Apple apps. Our reading recordings at Vox Olympia audiobooks are made for the benefit of the reading disabled, the blind, the children and everyone else interested in our selection of books. Our reading recordings are or conducted presently at the BLM Alvati Literary Arts Foundation. We thank our listeners for tuning in today on the 30th of August, 2022. Thanks and bye-bye. Hello and welcome to Vox Olympia Book Readings our reading recordings are made for the benefit of the blind, the reading disabled, children, and everyone else interested in our selection of books. Our recordings are conducted at the BL Himavati Literary Arts Foundation. On this day, the 31st of August, 2022, we continue with our reading from the Outline of History by H. G. Wells. Thank you listeners for tuning in. The Outline of History by H. G. Wells, Volume 1. Book 1, The World Before Man, Chapter 5, The Age of Mammals. The Age of Mammals 1. A New Age of Life 2. Tradition Comes Into the World 3. An age of brain growth. 4. The world grows hard again. 1. The great division of the geological record sketched out in the beginning of chapter 2 the Cenozoic opens with a world already physically very like the world we live in today. Probably the day was at first still perceptibly shorter, but the scenery had become very modern in its character. Climate was, of course, undergoing, age by age, its incessant and irregular variations. Lands that are temperate today have passed, since the Cenozoic Age began, through phases of great warmth, intense cold, and extreme dryness. There may have been variations in the landscape, but if it altered, it altered to nothing that cannot still be paralleled today in some part or other of the world. In the place of the cycads, sequoias, and strange conifers of the Mesozoic, The plant names that now appear in the lists of fossils include birch, beech, holly, tulip trees, ivy, sweet gum, breadfruit trees. Palms were now very important. Flowers had developed concurrently with bees and butterflies. 
we have come to the age of flowers. Flowering plants had already been in evidence in the later levels of the Mesozoic, that is, the American Cretaceous. But now they dominated the scene altogether and everywhere. Grass was becoming a great fact in the world. Certain grasses too had appeared in the later Mesozoic, but only for the Cenozoic period came grass plains and turf spreading wide over a world that was once barren stone. The period opened with a long phase of considerable warmth and the world cooled. In the opening of this part of the record, the Cenozoic period, a gigantic crumpling of the Earth's crust and an upheaval of mountain ranges was in progress. The Alps, the Andes, the Himalayas are all Cenozoic mountain ranges forced up, as we saw in the second chapter, by the westward movement of the Americas, the northward movement of India, and the rotation of Africa. Geologists make certain main divisions of the Cenozoic period, and it will be convenient to name them here and to indicate their climate. First comes the Eocene, which means the dawn of recent life, an age of exceptional warmth in the world's history, subdivided into an older and newer Eocene, then the Oligocene, meaning but little of recent life, in which the climate was still equable. The Miocene, with living species still in a minority, was the great age of mountain building. and the general temperature was falling. In the Pliocene, more living than extinct species, climate was very much at its present phase. But with the Pleistocene, the great majority of living species, there set in a long period of extreme condition, it was the Great Ice Age. Glaciers spread from poles towards the equator until England to the Thames was covered in ice. Therefore, to our own time came a period of partial recovery. We may be now moving towards a warmer phase. Half a million years hence, this may be much, a much sunnier and pleasanter world to live in than it is today. In the forests and following the grass over the Eocene plains, there appeared for the first time a variety and abundance of mammals. Before we proceed to any description of these mammals, 
it may be well for us to note in general terms what a mammal is. From the appearance of the vertebrated animals in the lower Paleozoic age, when the fish first swarmed out into the sea, there has been a steady progressive development of vertebrated creatures. A fish is a vertebrated animal that breeds by gills and can live only in water. An amphibian may be described as a fish that has added to its gill breathing the power of breathing air with its swimming bladder in adult life and that has also developed limbs with five toes to them in place of the fins of a fish. A tadpole is for a time a fish that becomes a land creature as it develops. A reptile is a further stage in this de detachment from water. It is an amphibian that is no longer amphibious. It passes through its tadpole stage, its fish stage, that is, in an egg. It can never breathe under water as a tadpole can do. Now, a modern mammal is really a sort of reptile that has developed a peculiarly effective protective covering, hair and that also retains its egg, its eggs in the body until they hatch so that it brings forth living young viviparous. And even after birth it cares for them and feeds them by its mammae for a longer or shorter period. Some reptiles some vipers, for example, are viviparous, but none stands by its young as the real mammals do. Both the birds and the mammals, which escaped whatever destructive forces made an end of the Mesozoic reptiles, and which survived to dominate the Cenozoic world, have these two things in common. First, a far more effective protection against changes of temperature than any other variation of the reptile type ever produced. And secondly, a peculiar care for their eggs to protect them from cold. The bird by incubation and the mammal by retention and a disposition to look after the young for a certain period after hatching or birth. In comparison with the mammal, the ordinary reptile is altogether reckless of its offspring. Hair was evidently the earliest distinction of the mammals from the rest of the reptiles. It is doubtful if the particular theromorph reptiles who were developing hair in the early Mesozoic were viviparous. Two mammals survive to this day which not only do not suckle their young but which lay eggs. The Ornithorhynchus and the Ectina. And in the Eocene, 
there were a number of allied forms. These two creatures, although they do not suckle their young, secrete a nutritive fluid from glands scattered over the skin on the belly side. But the glands are not gathered into mammae with nipples for suckling as they are in other mammals. The stuff oozes out while the mother lies on her back and the young browse upon her moist skin. They are the survivors of what was probably a much larger number and variety of small, egg-laying, hairy creatures, hairy reptiles, hoppers, climbers, and runners, which include the Mesozoic ancestors of all existing mammals up to and including man. At any time, in some out-of-the-way deposit, there may yet be a find of such missing links. We may put the essential facts about mammalian reproduction in another way. The mammal is a family animal. And the family habit involved the possibility of a new sort of continuity of experience in the world. Compare the completely closed in life of an individual lizard with the life of even a quite lowly mammal of almost any kind. The former has no mental continuity with anything beyond itself. It is a little self-contained globe of experience that serves its purpose and ends. But the latter picks up from its mother and hands on to its offspring. All the mammals, except for the two genera we have named, had already, before the lower Eocene age, arrived at this stage of pre-adult dependence and imitation. They were all more or less imitative in youth and capable of certain modicum of education. They all as a part of their development, received a certain amount of care and example and even direction from their mother. This is as true of the hyena and rhinoceros as it is of the dog or man. The difference of educability is enormous. But the fact of protection and educability in the young stage is undeniable. So far as the vertebrated animals go, these new mammals, with their viviparous, young protecting disposition, and these new birds, with their incubating young protecting disposition, introduce at the opening of the Cenozoic period a fresh thing into the expanding story of life, namely social association, the addition of hard, inflexible instinct of tradition and the nervous organization necessary to receive tradition. All the innovations that come into the history of life begin very humbly. The supply of blood vessels in the swimming bladder of the mudfish in the lower Paleozoic torrent river 
that enabled it to pull through a season of drought would have seemed at that time to the bodiless visitant to our planet we have already imagined a very unimportant side fact in the ancient world of great sharks and plated fishes sea scorpions and coral reefs and seaweed but it opened up the narrow way by which the land vertebrates arose to predominance the mudfish would have seemed then a poor refugee from the too crowded and aggressive life of the sea but once lungs were launched into the world every line of descent that had lungs went on improving them so too in the upper paleozoic the fact that some of the amphibia were losing the amphibiousness by a retardation of hatching of their eggs would have appeared a mere response to the distressful dangers that threaten the young tadpole yet that prepared the conquest of the dry land for a triumphant multitude of the mesozoic reptiles it opened a new direction towards a free and vigorous land life along which all the reptilian animals moved and this viviparous young tending training that the ancestral mammalia underwent during the age of inferiority and hardship for them set going in the world a new continuity of perception of which even man today only begins to appreciate only begins to appreciate the significance Three. A number of types of mammals already appear in the Eocene period. Some are differentiating in one direction, some in another. Some are perfecting themselves as herbivorous quadrupeds. Some leap and climb among the trees. Some turn back to the water to swim. but all types are unconsciously exploiting and developing the brain which is the instrument of this new power of acquisition and educability this age of flowers this age of birds and mammals the cenozoic age might also be called the age of the growing brain In the Eocene rocks are found small early predecessors of the horse, Eohippus, tiny camels, pigs, early tapirs, early hedgehogs, monkeys and lemurs, opossums and carnivores. Now all these were more or less ancestral to living forms and all had brains relatively much smaller than their living representatives There is for instance an early rhinoceros like beast Titanotherium with a brain not one tenth the size of that of the existing rhinoceros the latter is by no means a perfect type of the attentive and submissive student but even so it is 10 times more observant and teachable than its predecessor this sort of thing is true 
of all the orders and families that survive until today. All the Cenozoic mammals were doing this one thing in common under the urgency of a common necessity. They were all growing brain. It was a parallel advance in the same order or family today. The brain is usually from six to ten times what it was in the Eocene ancestor. The Eocene period displayed a whole series of herbivores brutes of which no representative survives today. Such by the Euanthotheris and the Titanotheris. They were ousted by more specialized Gramanivorous forms as grass spreads over the world. In pursuit of such beasts came great swarms of primitive dogs, some as big as bears, and the first cats, on his, one in particular, Smilodon, a small fierce looking creature with big knife-like canines, the first saber-toothed tiger, which was to develop into greater things. American deposits in the Miocene display a great variety of camels, giraffe camels with long necks, gazelle camels, llamas, and true camels. North America, throughout most of the Cenozoic period, appears to have been an open and easy continuation with Asia, and when at last the glaciers of the Great Ice Age and then the Bering Strait came to separate the two great continental regions, the last camels were left in the old world and the llamas in the new world. In the Eocene, the first ancestors of the elephants appeared in northern Africa as snouted creatures. The distinctive elephant's trunk dawned on the world in the Miocene and grew longer with the ages. Very gradually, age by age, the winters grew on the whole colder and harder and longer relatively to the summers. Age by age, the summers grew briefer. On an average, the winter snow lay a little later in the spring in each century, and the glaciers in the northern mountains gained an inch this year, receded half an inch next, came on in again a few inches. The record of the rocks tell us of the increasing chill. The Pliocene was a temperate time. Many of the warmth-loving plants and animals had gone from temperate latitudes, then rather less deliberately, some feet or some inches every year, the ice came into the temperate regions of the earth. An Arctic fauna, musk ox, woolly mammoth, woolly rhinoceros, lemming, 
ushers in the Pleistocene over North America and Europe and Asia alike, the ice advanced. For thousands of years it advanced and then for thousands of years it receded to advance again. Europe down to the Baltic shores, Britain down to the Thames, North America down to New England, and more centrally, as far south as Ohio, lay for ages under glaciers. Enormous volumes of water were withdrawn from the ocean and locked up in those stupendous ice caps so as to cause a worldwide change in the relative levels of land and sea. Vast areas were exposed that are now again sea bottom. There were four glacial ages during the two or three millennia, millennia, million years. There were four glacial ages during the two or three million years of the Pleistocene. separated by milder interglacial periods <laughs> as the ice temporarily receded. Meanwhile, in Africa, which may well have been the cradle of our genes and species, the glacial ages of the north were reflected as periods of extremely heavy and abundant rain. The world today is still coming slowly out of the last of a series of waves of cold. It is not growing warmer steadily. There have been and are fluctuations and are fluctuations. Remains of bog oaks, for example, which grew two or three thousand years ago, are found in Scotland at latitudes in which not even a stunted oak will grow at the present time. This uncertain change towards the warmth may go on, or it may not. We do not know. It is amidst the crescendo and the diminuendo of frost and snow in the Pleistocene that we first recognize forms that are like the forms of men. The age of mammals culminated in ice and hardship and man. End of chapter 5, The Age of Mammals, from Book 1, Volume 1 of The Outline of History by H.G. Wells. This has been a recording for Vox Olympia Audiobooks, available as podcasts on Anchor.fm, Spotify, Google, and Apple Apps. We thank our listeners for tuning in today on the 31st of August, 2022. Thanks and bye-bye.